Uh, this open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all members in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation in such, unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom. It's posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and <clears throat> take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard, and we recommend the members of the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus. We are, um, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude, the chair will go down the list of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair. After, um, so none of our items have public comment and each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. So um, we have, um, five people who signed up um, in advance for public comment and I'm gonna call on them a little bit out of order that I have on my thing because I need to find them in the list. So um, Mr. Joshua Roth is gonna go first. Mr. Roth. Uh, oh, actually, you, I'm sorry. You. you know what I need to do? I'm sorry to interrupt you. I need to take um, attendance so to make, make sure everybody can hear us. So, uh, Ms. Exton? Here. Mr. Cardin? Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? Here. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Here. Mr. Schlickman? Good evening. Uh, Mr. Hainer? who had just stepped out, but I think he's coming back. So we're still meeting, missing Mr. Cardin. Um, Dr. Bodie? Let's see her yet either. Dr. McNeil? Here. See him. Mr. Mason? Here. Uh, uh, Mr. Spiegel? Don't see him yet. Ms. Elmer? I'm here. Oh, you're here. Sorry. Oh, there you are. You're right next to me. Yeah. Um, Went to the here. Here. Dr. I'm here. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Elmer? Great. Here. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So we, um, so the, uh, just as a reminder for the public, um, that as a matter of policy, the school committee does not respond to public comment. Um, and the way that public comment was set up for this meeting was that people needed to sign up um, in advance. Um, so I'm going to call on the uh, the people who had signed up in advance. So Mr. Roth, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my thanks to the uh, entire assembled audience and to the school committee for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Joshua Roth. I am a resident of Arlington and a teacher at Arlington High School. I'm a proud member of the AEA. However, uh, my comments uh, do not represent the association, the faculty at Arlington High School or any other larger body than myself as a teacher and resident. Um, I simply wanted to ask um, that the school committee and administration uh, ensure that the entire Arlington community uh, know uh, what the protocols will be at the Arlington Public Schools in the event that the district is informed of a positive COVID result among staff, faculty, or students. Uh, I'm stopping here to just ask if I can be heard clearly, Chair. We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, 
would like to uh, mm -hmm. urge that stakeholders uh, uh, be informed of uh, positive COVID test in any of the Arlington public school buildings, uh, of course, in a manner that preserves privacy um, as required by law and custom. Um, will stakeholders be told uh, the type and number of tests that were administered? Uh, will teachers, staff, students, and families be told whether they were in proximity to a COVID positive individual? And if so, in what setting? What conditions, either locally or statewide, would result in a suspension of in-person instruction, be it in a particular class section, cohort for a particular teacher in their classroom or a building? Uh, how quickly would the process unfold if a cohort classroom or building were to shift to remote instruction uh, due to a COVID case, uh, pres presuming in-person instruction is in fact taking place in the setting? Uh, because of the contagious nature of the virus, I feel that stakeholders should be taken to include the Arlington community at large, as well as faculty, staff, students, and student families. I am aware that the State Education Department has issued some guidance uh, in this subject. However, I think it best that the district uh, communicate its intended approach and provide access to the details through a variety of channels, mail, community TV, the advocate, et cetera, as well as online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so next is Ms. Elena Mendez. If you can, you should be able to speak and we'll make sure that we can hear you. Hi. Hi, we can hear you, perfect, go Great. ahead. You Great. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I just wanted to, you know, thank everybody up front for your thoughtfulness throughout all of this. I know it's a very difficult decision making and I'm not gonna repeat all of the points made by everybody else, um, but acknowledge that there's a lot of valid points on all of the considerations that everyone raised. I just wanted to add to the debate three points that I haven't heard or seen um, raised before. Uh, so this is not meant to be a comprehensive list of issues, but three new points to add for consideration. Um, the first one is just to remind ourselves that when we are talking about any form of in-person um, model at the schools, it's really very small pots of 10 children with a teacher. So it's a very different situation from a restaurant worker or a grocery store worker that are constantly seeing different people. It's really a bigger pot that one's family, but not a huge increase. So it's important to keep that in mind. The second one is also just to take into account how keeping kids at home may exacerbate inequities. I feel very privileged that my family can afford to support our children in many different ways if they stay home. Um, we can help them with schoolwork, we can afford a tutor or some alternative arrangements, but a lot of families cannot and not having the option to send their children to school is really going to be a financial stress for them, uh, as well as put their kids at risk. And then the third thing, and perhaps the most important one of the three topics that I wanted to raise, is um, as someone who works in the mental health space, I think we should really uh, take into con consideration also the mental health of the children. Um, mental health impact, the mental health impact of remote schooling and lack of socialization will take months perhaps to be noticeable, but it is a silent killer. We already see the numbers of anxiety and depression in America skyrocketing both like among parents and children. And this is going to have a huge effect in the future generation. Um, it will increase all of the experts are saying rates of suicide for the coming years and other exacerbations of mental health issues. And you know, the decision on when the kids can start socializing and being supported in their mental health and social well-being will make a difference in those numbers and those rates of anxiety and, and depression and exacerbation of mental health issues. So that's just one more. I think important consideration that I haven't heard before um, discussed in the previous meeting that just wanted to make sure that everybody's keeping in mind. Thank you. Um, Ms. Alhan Sadat. Oh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. 
I'm speaking on behalf of myself and two other Arlington Public School parents, Mara Vatz and Angela Christiana, along with over 100 parent volunteers about outdoor options for in-person school time. Tonight, we're providing a brief update of these plans. The health and safety of students and teachers must be a priority in any back to school plan, and we must take every step to reduce the spread of COVID-19. In thinking about the highest risk behaviors during the school day, we are focusing on outdoor lunch, snack and mask breaks in elementary and sixth grade on all in-person days, unless severe weather prohibits outdoor time. Uh, there are also tents and portable classrooms being proposed at AHS and Audison. We will facilitate the creation of fully accessible outdoor spaces properly equipped to support those activities in order to achieve, to achieve a safer and healthier environment that reduces the chances of spreading viruses by the start of the school in fall of 2020. We have met with representative principals from the elementary schools and the Gibbs and are working on securing the following items. One, we are assessing details such as outdoor space, square footage, tree canopy, existing outdoor seating options at each of the schools. Uh, number two, we are pr pricing various outdoor seating options, hand washing and or hand sanitizing stations and fencing. Three, we are assessing what outdoor spaces are available adjacent to each of the schools and identifying what permits may be needed for parks and rec. And four, we're identifying appropriate funding sources to make all of this possible. Once we have this information collected, we will seek feedback from all stakeholders in our community. Again, we do not intend to increase the burden put on teachers and administrators during these challenging times and intend these efforts to be parent driven. We invite school committee members, administration, teachers, PTO leads, and parents to contribute to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brett Lambert. Thank you. Can you, can everyone hear me? Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak and um, thank you to everyone for your continued hard work in this uh, unprecedented time. Um, I would like to, I, I listened to the facilities subcommittee meeting last week and from what I heard it appeared that the facilities work update was in large part focused on ensuring all of the equipment was operating as intended. There was a lot of discussion about replacing motors and belts and servicing of equipment. Understanding that this, of course, is a critical first step, um, I was concerned that there was not an apparent update on the increased ventilation capacity or any talk about higher level of filtration being installed. Early on, a lot of the discussions and reports uh, were very much focused on increasing ventilation rates and installing MERV-13 filtration, but there was al always a caveat of where possible because at the time there was not, um, of course, an understanding of where all of that could be implemented. I'm very aware of how difficult of a task the facilities department and the school department is facing with trying to get all of these answers uh, together in a short period of time. Um, but I'm also very aware of how much ventilation and filtration can affect occupant health, even under normal circumstances. And I would like to ensure that increase, increasing ventilation and filtration above and beyond the code level ASHRAE standards that the equipment was previously operating at is still being hap is still a priority and still happening district wide. And furthermore, I'd like to understand where, if anywhere, this is not possible due to the existing equipment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Key. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm an Arlington parent of a child who will be a senior at AHS and a child who will be at Gibbs this year. I've also worked as a school counselor, school social worker in Arlington Public Schools for a decade. I have very significant concerns about the reopening plans from both of these perspectives. I'm very concerned about the inequitable education my child will receive as a senior at AHS if the hybrid model occurs. I hope you recognize that the 87% of parents, quote, choosing hybrid for the AHS students does not reflect actual intent or desire for students to attend in person. There was effectively no choice in order for my child to enroll in her classes. If the hybrid model occurs, I and others will be switching to remote due to health and safety concerns. The remote plan will offer, quote, graduation requirements, and she will only have access to standard English class, no longer an AP class, 
and she will have to independently prepare for the AP. It appears that she will lose access to another AP class, an honors class, pre-calculus, and all of her electives that she was so looking forward to as a senior. There will be no Arlington teachers as they'll all be assigned to hybrid based on everyone's initial commitment, and she'll have to teach herself via online platforms. This is not the education any Arlington taxpayer should receive for their child, particularly in their senior year. For my child at Gibbs, it seems clear to me that the all remote option is by far the better educational and social emotional option. He'll have synchronous, synchronous classes taught by APS teachers all day every day. Hybrid students will only have two days of synchronous in-person classes sitting at one desk all day restricted to a six foot bubble on all sides. Children may be struggling to hear their teacher 18 feet away behind a mask and a face shield. Many minutes of the day will be taken from education for the purposes of cleaning hands, taking mask breaks, and extra time to transition to the cafeteria with 100 other students where they will, assign, well, they will be assigned to a desk with the six foot bubble from everyone else again. They cannot work in small groups. They cannot share a smile, a hug, a high five, or even a pencil. Never mind have a personal conversation with the friends. I'm not even touching on the issues with the bathrooms. I see no benefit here, only an incredibly socially emotionally stifled environment with constant reminders of the health risks that they're facing. This is not an environment primed for learning. As a school counselor, we have approximately 250 students on each of our caseloads. In a typical year, it's challenging to say the least to work with as many students. Counselors have not been given any plan that would reduce our physical health risk exposure to less than our typical caseload numbers. Even if we were all to work remotely, keeping our caseload so high at this time significantly decreases our abilities to appropriately attend to the drastically increased mental health needs of our students and families. In less than 40 hours, APS staff are due to report for work. I still have not been given notice about whether or not I will be granted a remote position. If I am granted a remote positions, I don't know if I'll actually be able to work from home or still be required to go into the school building. Due to health and safety concerns, I've requested a leave of absence if I'm not able to work from home. I don't know if that will be granted. If it is, I'll get no salary for the year and will be expected to pay over $20,000 in order to keep my family's health insurance, which is one of the least expensive plans offered. If my leave is not granted and I resign, I'll be out of a job with no realistic prospect of ever being able to get another job in a school. This has not been a summer off. It's been an unbelievably stressful summer, wondering what will become of my job and my future, and I still have no answers, despite multiple meetings. As a clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience, I'm extremely concerned about the social emotional impact of students attending school in person this year. Is it tough on social emotional health not to go to school? Absolutely. And I believe it will be far worse to go back now. How will children feel when school staff and friends start getting sick? How will children feel who bring COVID back to their family members who later die? I don't think you need to have my professional background to start to imagine the answers to these questions. It's not if COVID will return to APS, but when. There was a 90% increase in COVID cases in US children from mid-July to mid-August. 90 plus children have died. Now that children are being taken out of their homes to return to school, school buildings with hundreds of people and enclosed spaces for multiple hours a day, what will happen to those numbers? What if there's just one kid at APS who dies? What if that one dead kid is your kid? Ms. Key, I need you to wrap up because you're at about four minutes now. So if you can just finish, that would be great. As school committee meets together remotely for health and safety reasons, I implore you to reconsider your choice of an in-person reopening plan for our thousands of children and staff. A full remote plan provides the best education for our children. It's the safest, both physically and mentally for our community, as well as the most equitable for students and staff. Remote learning and working are not ideal, but it's what we need to do right now. We are not in an ideal situation. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Keyes? All right, thank you, everybody. Um, it has been an awful couple of weeks to be union president. Let me just tell you that. Um, so in one of my many conversations with educators this summer, our recently retired teacher gave me this advice, times change, values endure. And I've, that really struck with me and I've done a lot of thinking about what our values are this summer so as, since that conversation. When summer began, we were looking forward to going back to school in person this fall. As time passed, that process has just become more and more complicated. The AEA asked Arlington to put safety first 
And the district has done a really admirable job of securing testing for staff and updating our building ventilation systems. When staff were surveyed at the end of July, 58% said they wanted to start remotely. There were many lingering concerns, which is why we asked the committee to plan for a phased reentry that would start with our highest needs students and then bring back the rest of the students into the building. This committee chose to ignore that request and start in a full hybrid model. You voted for that before even discussing the plans. And as they were revealed, more and more questions were raised questions which still have not been answered. In fact, no one has been able to answer questions about the schedule in the month that has now elapsed. We don't know how prep periods will be covered or how specialists will be limited to a cohort of students for safety. We don't know if we're gonna be able to hire enough staff to adequately fill the schedules and monitor the students safely. We don't know how to run a high school schedule in a hybrid model because of the wide range of core and elective classes. There are not enough hours in the day for the special education services required and meetings that are needed in special ed in our hybrid schedules. The increased custodial load, triple the cleaning in 11 buildings, defies the logic of a 2.0 FTE increase. There are not enough hours in the day for both teaching in person and preparing lessons for students at home, let alone the grading that goes with it. The schedules reduce prep time for many staff rather than increasing it as this committee talked about at the August 10th meeting. And perhaps most alarming, there is almost no opportunity for individual attention to students as teachers will be at least six feet away in person and with a different group when students are at home. Our teachers want to be back in the building, but not like this. The hybrid schedules that exist right now are a chaotic nightmare. And the truth is, we're used to starting in chaos. We're used to schedules not being done or still changing on the first day or students showing up in the wrong place. We're used to the unknowns and we make it work but we can't do that this year. If a schedule for a student is wrong, we can't just move them to another class because there are hard limits on class size for safety. If there's no one to cover a prep period, you can't just ask someone to step in because it will break the cohort. We can't combine classes with a substitute when a teacher is sick. We simply cannot cover up the systematic failures this year the way teachers and other educators have done in the past. And so last week I surveyed our members again and I asked them how they felt about the plans. I asked, do you support returning to school with the current proposed hybrid schedule for your building? And nearly 82% said no. I asked, do you believe that the current proposed hybrid schedule for your building will provide a high quality education to students? And more than 88% said no. And I asked if you would support the union in a strong push to begin remotely while the district continues to work on a better hybrid plan. And more than 90% said yes. I hope you can see how strong the opposition is to the hybrid plans among the staff. If you move forward with this, you are doing so without the support of the educators in the district. We have been sounding the alarm for a month in department meetings, building faculty meetings, and in our union meetings with administration. These plans don't work. You're not listening. You are so determined to put kids in physical buildings that you are sacrificing the quality of the education they will receive to get them there. We can do better. We teach our students to learn from failure and do better next time. These plans are failing. Let's pause, let's start remotely and correct the course to a hybrid model designed by teams with teacher representation. We can use models from other districts that found a better way or we can build our own putting education first. Let's utilize our current staffing to get our highest needs kids in first and then add more groups as we fill the many open positions that we have right now. So what are our values? Do we value quality education based on research best practice? Do we value relationships between teachers and students? 
Do we value staff collaboration in developing lessons and in caring for students? Or do we value a physical presence in a building, even if it sacrifices the learning and the relationship? Your decisions thus far show that you believe it's better to be in the building no matter the cost. And we are telling you as loudly and as clearly as possible that the educational and emotional costs of these hybrid plans are too high for our students. We really value the working relationship with, that the teachers in the district have with our administration. This is not their fault. Everybody's doing the best that they can, and this is an unsolvable problem. Every other town is going through the same thing. But time's up on debating. We start school Wednesday. We need to correct course on this. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Keyes, for sharing this important message from our union. Um, just so that everybody uh, at home watching is aware, the district and the AEA are in active and ongoing negotiations that began after our August 10th meeting. Um, I think they've met five or six times, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, negotiations happen in executive session, they are confidential, and it means that it's challenging and difficult for the administration or the committee to be able to respond or comment as it can be considered public bargaining. Um, but it's important for the full committee and for the community to hear from the AEA. So I'm, I'm very grateful that they were here, that uh, Ms. Keyes was able to share um, with all of you tonight. Um, so typically uh, subcommittee reports for our school committee happen at the end of the meeting, um, but for tonight's meeting, since so many of them have met in the last 10 days, I elected to bring the committee reports to the front so that we can hear directly from subcommittee chairs about their meetings. Um, as the public knows, the school committee approved the superintendent's recommendation to begin in a hybrid model with a remote option. Due to facilities concerns, the high school will start remotely. And in order to work through the other pieces of the motion related to facilities, metrics, testing, et cetera, many of our subcommittees met over the last few weeks. Um, not every school committee member is on every subcommittee, although many attend some or all of the meetings. Many of our administrators have been at so many meetings. Um, Ms. Keyes has been at so many meetings um, over the last few weeks. Um, but I wanted to bring these reports forward um, as a way to make sure that everybody has the information that we received. Um, so tonight we're going to hear um, in order from uh, facilities, budget, uh, curriculum, policy, and then finally the superintendent search. Um, so we're going to start with the facilities subcommittee report from Mr. Thielman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Morgan. Uh, so after, as uh, Ms. Morgan said, after the school committee voted on August 10th to adopt Dr. Bodie's uh, recommendation to begin the school year with a hybrid model, each of the subcommittees were asked to meet to uh, break down different parts of that motion and, uh, and speak about it uh, with district administrators. So the facilities subcommittee, um, which includes Dr. Kersey Allison Ampey and myself met on Wednesday, August 26th at 2 p.m., uh, Dr. Bodie, Mr. Mason, Mr. Spiegel, Dr. Janger, Mr. McCarthy from the high school, Mr. Feeney were present along with Ms. Morgan and Mr. Hainer. So lots of people um, were there for the conversation. Uh, Mr. Feeney reviewed um, an Excel spreadsheet uh, that included a status report on HVASC equipment throughout the district. Um, and he said this review and repairs would be ongoing. Um, after reviewing the report, Mr. Feeney was asked uh, what would, uh, you know, what, what, what classrooms would be ready uh, and when, and he was confident that the HVAC, HVAC systems would be up to speed and that classrooms would be ready for opening uh, in grades K through sixth and all the elementary schools and the Gibbs Middle School by uh, the 21st of September. Um, Mr. Feeney said that he anticipates that the ventilation systems in all but two classrooms at the Addison Middle School will be working on September 21st. Dr. Bodie uh, said in the meeting that assuming uh, that the average daily enrollment in the hybrid model stays uh, as it's currently projected, 
um, she does not anticipate a delay in reopening that school because of ventilation concerns. Mr. Feeney said that he needed more information uh, to make an assessment of Arlington High School. The district is fixing a, a large rooftop air handler on Fusco House. Um, the Downs House is and should be ready by September 21st. Um, and uh, Mr. McCarthy from the high school informed us at the meeting that uh, the building contractor for the HS building contract in Sigley uh, won't have um, all of the HV, all of the uh, uh, air conditioning installed in the high school um, until sometime after September 21st, sometime in early October. The committee uh, had a discussion um, in the second part of the meeting after a general overview of HVAC in the district, the committee uh, had a discussion about Arlington High School um, and uh, Dr. Janger and Mr. McCarthy are putting together a report. <clears throat> um, I've not seen a copy of it yet, but um, the, uh, we asked for some specific information on the size of each AHS classroom, the number of students each can hold while meeting COVID-19 restrictions the possibility of using any other space in or out of the building for instruction, um, and any, uh, in, any reductions in electives or other course offerings that may have to occur because of uh, uh, a return to schooling. Um, <clears throat> we, um, Mr. Mr. Mason asked that the facility subcommittee meet again. We're gonna do that. Uh, I'll talk to Dr. Kersey Allison Ampey and uh, get a date. There were questions about um, ventilation. Uh, there was a question tonight. Mr. Feeney has a, did a pine on that in the meeting. Um, and essentially what he said is that um, we can increase mechanical fresh air ventilation in the classrooms, um, but we'll be limited in our capacity to do so as winter conditions um, uh, get more extreme. So that was the meeting. It was a good discussion and um, We'll meet again, probably, I don't know if we're gonna meet before the 10th or we'll meet after the 10th, we'll find that out. Thank you. Um, do committee members, do you guys wanna, you wanna ask, I mean, this is sort of a report on the meeting. So I, I think if you have questions about um, the content, we should do that probably as our part of our reopening report and, and just do these subcommittee reports you know, as they come. So, um, Dr. Allison Ampey on budget. Thank you. Budget subcommittee met on August 26th to discuss the budget needs resulting from COVID and school reopening. In addition to subcommittee and school com school committee members, we were joined by Dr. Bodie, Mr. Mason, and Dean Carmen of the Finance Committee. The intent was to discuss the following: remote by choice additional budgetary needs, hybrid additional budgetary needs facilities, additional budgetary needs, transportation needs, and anything else. As, as, um, to address these things, Mr. Mason presented a draft spreadsheet, and an updated version of this can be found in Nova's note. It looks, it's this one. Not that you can see. I'm not gonna try and screen. Actually, maybe I will screen share a little bit. Um, so we basically looked at the spreadsheet and then discussed it. Uh, topics and questions raised included a desire to increase the number of substitute teachers to allow building substitute per learning community or per day. Concerns that the salary designated by contract may not be sufficient to attract these teachers. Um, questions from the committee about additional needs, for example, computer, software, licenses. Um, committee wondered, also if we needed additional staff, including licensed teachers. And then um, we wondered how much money was being put towards uh, accomplishing the testing, which is being described. The committee felt it would be helpful to have a summary of all spending being put towards reopening the school to share with the public in the future, and would like to see this developed in the near future. Additionally, the subcommittee encouraged the administration to consider and present needs that even if they might stretch beyond our current budget because it was felt that this indeed is the time to utilize rainy day funds. Um, additional needs I heard, oh, never mind. Um, let me, can I screen share? I have not, Mason, oh wait, oh, sorry. just a sec. Let me find the thing I want to screen share first. Um, I was just gonna pull up the, 
the, uh, sorry, I didn't anticipate doing, okay, where is it? Okay. Okay, yeah, can I screen share? Sure. Okay. You see the green button at the bottom? Yeah, let me, let me make sure I know where I'm going. Yes, okay, I know where I'm going. Oh, I forgot. Um, I have to fix. Uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll screen share it for you, Kersey. Give me one second. Okay, yeah, just, I'm sorry. I forget that we have, um, I have to fix things on my computer and I forget. I have not had the screen share yet. So I'm just gonna put up the, um, ask Michael to put up the spreadsheet that is also in our Novus thing. So. It's available, Kersey. Right, great. Um, so what this shows is that it breaks down the different uh, categories where we anticipate additional funds. You'll notice there are a number of things that are to be determined. That's because we know that they're likely to be needed, but we haven't figured out how many or how much we're going to be spending on those. But it includes an additional learning community, the Audison and at the Gibbs, building substitute teachers, this, a second grade teacher at the Stratton um, and additional administrative and instruction planning time. Some of these things, the, the, they're listed as a quantity of one. That's just to make the math work. Um, the, they obviously don't, don't worry about that. Um, in terms of facilities, there's a need for custodians and cleaning supplies. There uh, are full-time equivalents for custodians and training, um, as well as supplies, and also including tents for outdoor spaces uh, and other things. Then moving on to technology, there are Chromebooks uh, for students, MacBooks, iPads. Um, great. And uh, software plus additional expenses, including nurses and um, some administrative costs. So what that shows is that we're, right now we've got, we're spending a little bit beyond what we anticipate, what, what we have, but we've also informed the administration that we can spend beyond that if they feel that there are needs which should be addressed. Um, and uh, that's about it. Great, thank you. Um, curriculum, uh, Mr. Cardin. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, Curriculum Instruction Assessment and Accountability Subcommittee met Friday morning to get an update on the um, back to school plans. Uh, most of the principals were there, Dr. McNeil was there, Dr. Bodhi, um, Dr. Bisson, uh, information on the technology director, most of the um, uh, department heads were there, so it was uh, quite a large group. Um, we did get uh, some update on the plans. Uh, it's important to note that you know the 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 document submitted on on October, I'm sorry, on August 10th um, by the superintendent uh, was sort of the the basic overview plan, and the details continue to get filled in. Um, there are many things that. Um, uh, affect how those details will be determined. Uh, one, one big one was the number of students that selected the different models, which um, uh, we still didn't have firm numbers on Friday because there were some people that submitted two responses. There were some people that didn't submit any response. Um, so we're getting close to those numbers. Maybe Dr. Bodhi will update that in her presentation, but that the numbers who choose the different models um, determine how many staff can be allocated to which model. At the middle school, for example, um, there's about a third of the students or 30% or so of the students 
that uh, did choose the remote option, the remote academy. And we did hear from Mr. Merringer, um, something that concerns many parents is that that split does, will likely, um, you know, he's still working through the details, but that will likely allow uh, um, the foreign language teachers to split their day so they can teach in both programs. Uh, in Spanish, for example, there's enough to allocate a full Spanish teacher to the remote program, but the Latin teacher would have to split her day and that might, that might uh, hopefully the schedule will work out so that she can do that. So we heard a little bit more about um, things that were evolving in the plans. We heard from Dr. Bisson uh, that we are moving to utilize Zoom uh, as one of the technologies to use, but otherwise we're sticking with the Google Suite. Um, and we heard from Dr. Jenger a little bit more details about the phase in for the high school. Uh, in the plan, there weren't any certain dates, but he, I think he's proposing uh, to wait until the end of the first term to start phasing in the hybrid model, uh, assuming that all the building work is done at that time. So again, as, as, you know, as things evolve, the details are getting filled in. We heard about bathrooms, for example, how bathroom use. Uh, Susan Frankie, our Director of Nursing Services, is visiting each building with each principal to look at the bathrooms, determine how many students can be in a bathroom at a time, and the buildings are working out protocols for figuring out how students get sent to the bathroom, which is going to be unique for each building. So all of those details, you know, I got a question from a parent, how are we going to drop our kids off? Uh, all of those details are obviously still being worked out. There's an there's a enormous number of details um, that do have to be worked out and the administrative team is working, you know, day and night to do that. And uh, they are bringing in their teachers, uh, particularly next week, the teachers will be back on staff and uh, we'll be able to help work out some of those details. So um, that was the basic update. And I think Dr. Bodhi and her update will, will have a, a bit more information as well. Thank you. Great. Um, and Mr. Schlickman, I'm going to have you do policy and then uh, call on yourself to switch over to superintendent search, if that's all right with you. Okay, good. Yeah, thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, good, because I was having uh, a little issues with my headset. Um, <clears throat> Policies and procedures, we met this morning, we had a discussion with Doug Heim. Uh, sorry for the delay in getting the meeting in, but we had to work around Doug's availability as well. Uh, the basics are, uh, there are three, uh, three policies that are up for second read, EBC, BEDB, and JJK. Um, EBC has a slight change at the recommendation to Mr. Heim, uh, Doug Heim. Um, Doug recommended the addition to the language and or the town of Arlington among the organizations that could issue COVID emergency orders in two, in two places highlighted in red in the uh, policy copy for EBC supplemental that uh, is before you at this point. Uh, that we can vote or just go through when we do the second read. Um, EBCFA is face coverings. It, uh, the last subcommittee meeting, we questioned whether we needed to do this <clears throat> because there's already an emergency declaration. However, upon legal advice, we were advised that yes, we should do EBCFA and uh, we sent it out to you. Um, and we need to do a, uh, suspend the rules in order to enact it past a second reading tonight. And that is the recommendation of the uh, subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Hainer and uh, <clears throat> Dr. Allison Ampey uh, may want to further comment on that. You've covered it very well for me. Mm -hmm. Same. Okay. Uh, so I move that we suspend the rules to adopt policy EBCFA uh, face coverings. Second. Discussion. So this is only a vote to suspend the rules, correct, Mr. Schlickman? Are we gonna we're gonna do these policies after the consent agenda? But I'm gonna add if we approve this, I'm gonna add. EBCFA to the list of three that we already have. Is that is my understanding correct? 
yeah, that's the way we can do that. You can add that to the second read list. And so that uh, when we get to the uh, policies at the end, we'd be enacting the four policies, including the minor change to uh, uh, EBC supplemental. Great. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote on this. Oh, Mr. Cardin. Sorry. Nope. Sorry. Um, so just a question about the policy as well as in, in relation to the internal protocol that we saw an early draft of there there's a, there's more detail in that protocol but um, mm -hmm. just want to make sure that those those two can harmonize and not be conflicting was that considered essentially uh, the policy will enable the protocol I mean we could if the committee wishes come back in two weeks and offer uh, the protocol is uh, EB CFA-E is an exhibit to the policy, but I don't think it's necessary. Great, thanks. I just want to make sure there wasn't anything that, that, nothing that we're adopting that conflicts with what they were proposing. Okay, any other uh, discussion? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote on the suspension um, so that we can vote this later. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Gilman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Okay, back to you, Mr. Schlickman. Okay, now moving into the superintendent search subcommittee meeting. We met on Friday, uh, made a lot of progress. Uh, the minutes are in the packet, but I'll walk you through them. Um, we received the MASC focus group report which is attached to the minutes of the uh, August 28th meeting. The uh, report is also now posted at arlingtonsuper.com. Arlingtonsuper.com is where members of the public can go and find that report. Um, we talked about the recruitment brochure. Uh, we discussed dates and language for the brochure. Uh, the committee agreed that October 9th at 3 p.m. would be the deadline for superintendent candidates to submit applications to MASC with the intent to appoint the uh, new superintendent uh, by a vote of the full school committee in mid-December 2020. Uh, the subcommittee looked at various MASC brochures uh, and they're attached to, in novice to the uh, subcommittee meeting. Uh, the subcommittee was most interested in Bedford and Lexington's brochure. We also had in, uh, the uh, brochure we had out when we hired Dr. Bodie uh, 10 years ago, so we can see the progress that uh, we've been able to make in terms of doing brochures. Uh, a draft brochure was prepared by uh, MASC, and if you have any suggestions to edit or change it, Please submit them by noon on Wednesday. The subcommittee will meet again Thursday, September 3rd at 10 a.m. so that we'll be able to make any adjustments to the um, brochure and vote to authorize it to be posted with the application form for superintendent candidates. Now, we have a second set of applications we have to go through. The second one is for the screening committee. The subcommittee will finalize an invitation for persons wishing to serve on the screening committee uh, at, on Thursday's meeting. Mr. Kuchar suggested we ask for a statement of interest and reason for participating, which is standard for their searches. He also recommended uh, a statement describing, uh, affirming their time commitment and giving notice that we were going to set a date for the initial meeting, the training session, and please do not apply to join the committee if you cannot attend that session and cannot make a, a large time commitment to being present at all screening uh, uh, meetings. Uh, Mr. Cardin uh, found the Waltham uh, invitation on their website, presented it to us, and it's uh, tagged at the end of the minutes in order that folks can take a look at that. It will probably work off of that. Uh, 
the applications will be available after the September 3rd subcommittee meeting. Now the size and categorical composition of the screening committee will be recommended by the subcommittee uh, and brought forth at the September 10th school committee meeting. So we're setting forth the application, but we're not going to go forth with the composition or the categorical composition, how many members and how many need to be from whatever category until it's approved by the, the full committee. The deadlines for, uh, at the September 10th meeting, the deadline for submitting applications to serve on the screening committee uh, we're targeting for September 17th, so the, the subcommittee can go screen the applications and make a recommendation for appointment to the full school committee on September 24th. Once that committee is in place, the screening committee will hold its orienta orientation meeting sometime between then and October 9th and begin work on or after October 13th. Uh, Mr. Kuchar gave a prototypical 13-member screening committee to the, to the group. We may do 13, we may do 15, the, hard, the larger it is, the more, more problems you can have with uh, coordinating schedules and getting uh, 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 a, a manageable group to, uh, to interact with candidates. So he's recommending 13 to 15 as a target number for members of the committee. Um, that I think covers what we've talked about again uh, Thursday at 10 a.m. is our next meeting. Um, and if you want to uh, <clears throat> uh, look at the, uh, bro uh, the draft brochure, please uh, uh, get, get information back to me by Wednesday at noon so I can forward it to MASC and they can play with it. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Shipman. Um, the sort of next piece is the reopening, uh, discussion of reopening, fall reopening plans, uh, Dr. Bodhi. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Well, first let me begin uh, by just saying to the committee and to the community that uh, my recommendation and the recommendation of all the administrators uh, that we've been, I've been working with is to, re is to still have a hybrid plan and a remote choice plan. We're actually calling it more of a remote academy now because there's been a lot of uh, confusion about, um, about that term. So we have two programs that we are planning for simultaneously. And one of the, there was a motion by the committee on August 10th, with, which had several, con eight conditions to it. Um, and I do want to speak to all of those uh, conditions. But one of them, um, was um, supporting an application to the Department of Education in order to have three additional days for planning and preparation. That application was approved and our first day for students is going to be September 21 for both programs. Uh, parents have been notified, uh, staff have been notified that that will be the first day for students. However, there'll be nine days Prior to that, that we will have um, extensive professional development planning collaboration as we plan for the start of the new year. Now, the first day of school is going to be this coming Wednesday. And it's, that was set on the calendar some time ago. Um, this day will be, as we have always had, sort of a, a, a welcome to everyone and there will be uh, faculty meetings after that. The afternoon of the, of the first teacher day of the year is also spent with teachers having a chance to work in their classrooms or offices. So as we, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the um, hybrid and remote plans and give a little bit of update where we are with, with the planning for that. We're going to hear from Dr. McNeil and some of the principals about uh, um, more detail about the hybrid and the remote academy plans. And then I have a, a, a number of other items. Um, the hybrid and the remote plan, Mr. Cardin is correct. We had at the middle school, roughly about 30% of our families. It's about 25% and at the high school, 13%. Uh, since we, we, we actually, 
had to spend a fair amount of time last week actually going through because there were a lot of duplicates. Um, and and I, I think, you know, some parents both filled out a form. So we had to, so the, the, uh, the school uh, principals administration had to go through each one of the list just to make sure that we didn't have any duplicates and we had um, um, actual numbers. So after that process um, was completed, we did begin the process of looking at how the remote academy is going to be set up. And I think one of the, the positives we found is that for the most part, with very little exception, the remote program is going to be within each school. So the teachers of a particular elementary school will be teaching the, um, the remote academy classes. Now, there are you know, a couple of exceptions that it could be that we will have students from one school being assigned to another, but that's really gonna be really the minority of the situations. And that would happen in the situation where we, we really did need to balance class sizes so that uh, one, one class was not substantially larger than another from, the, uh, from a different school. Now, we have been targeting the range for these um, remote academy classes at around 23 to 25. And I suspect that, that the vast majority of those classes will be within that range. We are not um, choosing to have classes of 30. So um, the, we have begun, a, the, begun the process actually of contacting teachers. Uh, we are not finished with that process yet. Uh, letting them know that they're that they have been assigned to the remote academy. Um, we have, for the most part, as I said, we've we've already been working mainly on classroom teachers um, this weekend and today. Everyone who chose to have uh, select the remote academy has been um, given that opportunity. We still have to take a look at some of the other non-classroom positions, and that will be done tomorrow. But um, we are, we are, there's, a, there's a, a fairly positive correlation there between the people who would like to be in that program and those, and the positions that we have. But I think one of the things that I really liked about this is that the teachers in a particular building will be um, teaching the children in that building in the remote um, academy. Another positive of that is that uh, our faculties will continue to meet as a faculty, departments continue to meet as a department, whether you are assigned to the remote academy or whether you're in the hybrid program. And that's actually one of the reasons why we are having an early release for all schools on Wednesdays in order to make that possible. So one of our, our goals in this process is to make sure that there is uh, uniformity between curriculum in the hybrid and the remote choice programs, which um, uh, is certainly will be something that we begin with and will be an ongoing effort as we go through the year. So um, one of the other things that we have um, been looking into in many, many of our classes that are going to be in the hybrid program, we are going to use as, the outdoors as much as possible. Um, I think one of, I want to say that an advantage, there's always pros and cons to all these programs, either program. We, we know that neither one is, is, is the ideal of what we'd like, which is all students to be back in school on a regular schedule. But that's not possible. And um, we're going to make both of these programs as, as successful as we possibly can this year. But one of the pieces on this is that by having a remote academy, it does free up spaces in, in the various schools. And that's actually very important because um, we do need more space uh, for the hybrid program. We wanna make sure that you know, any, any small group class that was in a room that might be too small for it under the, under the conditions that we've set up for this year, that, they, that that class could be in a different location. Um, so we, again, we, so that we're very clear on this, what we have set up in our classrooms is that the desks are six feet apart, seat to seat, and our expectation is that the children, pre-K through 12, 
will be wearing masks as well as the teachers in the building. It does not mean we will not have mass breaks, we will. And I think having tents set up where we can in, in buildings will also make that more possible even when the weather may not be uh, um, as hospitable to being outside as otherwise. So um, we, uh, Mr. Feeney has prepared an update on the ventilation um, room by room for the, for the department, for the, the school committee as well as an overview of the work they've been doing. This work will be ongoing. Uh, I think that everything should be probably completed. At least the expectation is by next week, if not even this week. And, and really what's, what is left is, is quite minor in our, um, our pre-K-8 buildings. The high school on the other hand is still going to need more time as we evaluate the rooms. And, and actually the issue at the high school is is not as much about ventilation as it is about space. Um, when you have a hybrid program, and Dr. Janger is here tonight, can talk a little bit more about this, but actually the hybrid program uh, it does require more classrooms than we would have otherwise. And so it's just making sure that we have sufficient classrooms and that those classrooms do have the ventilation that uh, we, are, we are expecting in, our, in all of our classrooms this year. So with respect to where we are in the presentation this evening, I would like to ask Dr. McNeil if he would um, give an update on the plans. I know that, as Mr. Cardin said, we are filling in the details, as he said, in the planning as we go forward. And um, we have made a lot of progress. It's not to say that we don't, we're not going to be doing more planning. Um, the ex full expectation is that we're going to continue to tweak and refine these these schedules so that they work as well as we possibly can make them. So uh, Dr. McNeil, um, I know you're here. And if you would like to, um, you have a slide deck that you could yeah, share with yes. everyone. Yes, I am going to share my screen. And then I am going to uh, just give an overview of the things that we were asked to do to try to give context for what people would be viewing in the uh, slide deck and then I'm going to ask the principals uh, to help me to give them an opportunity to talk about the schedules that they have added to the slide deck. So let me just make sure. So let me back up here to the first slide. Okay, so um, can everybody, let me just make sure that everybody can see my screen. Is that a yes? Yes, thumbs up. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, the part of the um, request from school committee was for us to look at the hybrid schedule and then look at the remote component of that hybrid schedule and to fill in more details as it relates to the student schedule. And we've also been asked to look at Wednesday and provide more details as to what, you know, what that day would look like from the teacher point of view and from the student point of view. And then what, so what you will see in the slide deck, you will see the hybrid schedules, you will see a more flushed out student schedule, and you will see details as to what that Wednesday will look like. So I'm going to begin with the element elementary portion of it. And I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Kate Peretz, uh, who has worked very diligently with the other elementary principals to add those details. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. And good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Peretz. I'm the principal at the Hardy Elementary School. Um, and I am representing the elementary level tonight. Um, and before I start, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who has worked so hard over the summer. Um, it's certainly not just the administrators who have been working through the summer. Um, our teachers have participated a great deal um, in the decision-making process and in professional development over the summer, um, and it has really been uh, a wonderful thing to see. Um, we also appreciate all of our families out there uh, watching this and also at home who have been very, very patient as this process, this difficult uh, summer and process unfolds, so thank you. 
Um, so basically there are two versions of, we're looking right now at a um, typical, what could be a typical schedule for an elementary educator on the remote days during the hybrid model. So this is something that has come up quite a lot um, with our educators thinking about what are the roles and responsibilities during this time. So what we have decided is that the educators that we have um, for art, music, PE, and library will be the ones who are beginning the days. So we have mentioned in other meetings that um, on those remote days in the hybrid model, that it might not be the classroom teacher, that it, it probably won't be the classroom teacher who is spending most of that live contact time with um, students who are at home, um, that it will be other people who work within our building. So it could be paraprofessionals or it could be some of our teachers who are focused on particular subjects like art, music, PE, and library. So they'll start the day. Our focus is always social emotional in the morning with a morning meeting, with greeting everyone to the day. Um, we will be taking attendance um, and making sure that we're following that. Um, and then typically if it is a specialist, it can roll right into that first period. So the students on these days when they're home um, will really have the opportunity to participate in these um, you know, special classes, right? So it also could be digital literacy on some days, it could be instrumental music on some days, um, and then as we go through the periods of the day, you'll see that there are screen break breaks that are built in, um, and typically about 10 minutes between those um, classes so that the adults have a chance to shift gears and think about the next class. Um, as they go through the periods of the day, um, the adults who are working will have their prep periods and lunch periods. Um, and attendance will be taken at the beginning of each of these live um, sessions to monitor how the students are doing throughout the day. And then at the end of the day, um, it might be a kindergarten class, for example, because while most of our sessions are 40 minutes, um, we have decided that the kindergarten sessions will be slightly shorter at 30 minutes. Um, so that's just an example of what those teachers are doing during the day. The classroom teachers are with the children who are in the classroom in person. So as was mentioned before, and as we've talked about at other meetings, the, there are pros and cons to each of the various models. So one of the benefits of the hybrid model is that there are two full days of in-person instruction with an educator in the building. So um, we don't want that person to be necessarily torn between these two worlds. We want their focus to be on the children who are present. Um, and before they, uh, the children leave for the day during those in-person days, uh, the classroom teachers will take care to make sure that they're setting up the children for their work on the days that they're home, they'll have the materials that they need, um, and that it won't necessarily always be uh, on the computer, that work that they're doing. We wanna be sensitive to the screen time. Um, on the next uh, slide, Dr. McNeil, We'll look at a schedule for, um, oh, sorry, I'm going a little ahead of myself. Um, some of the things that I just um, talked about were bulleted on that uh, slide there, thinking about other considerations. Um, so those are just some of the things that I just spoke about. Um, this slide is really just about what a student might expect to do on that day. So it'll be the same thing. They'll be getting ready for the day. There'll be a live connection with an adult in the building during that time in order to do that morning me meeting. Um, it might be an art music or PE teacher. It could be a paraprofessional. It could be another adult in the building, but that person will be consistent so that the children will know who it is that they're looking for. Each one of the adults in the building will be assigned to one of the various cohorts to work with the classrooms, um, and that serves multiple purposes. Um, one is to keep the contact with um, the whole big building to a minimum for the students and the um, educators, but it's also because we really wanna build strong personal relationships with the adults and the students in our buildings, whether we're in person or whether we're on the computer. Um, so there will be a couple of times during the day that the student is able to do these classes. 
Um, so these classes will not be happening when they're on the in-person day. We're gonna focus it on the hybrid, uh, the remote part of the hybrid schedule um, so that on the days when the students are in person, um, they'll have more of a focus with their teacher on the academic calendar and on uh, the social emotional development. Um, as you look through this, you'll see that as we get to various blocks of academics at 920, we have second period. That's a math block, it's asynchronous lessons. And so these will be recorded. Um, our coaches and other curriculum um, leaders within our district will be doing some of this with classroom teachers and also for classroom teachers. Uh, as we've mentioned before, we really want this to be um, a effort that is very collaborative and so that classroom teachers will be able to work together with coaches to do this work. Uh, the curriculum itself is really going to dig down into essential standards. Um, and the idea here is to really get to those learning understandings and not necessarily just worry about coverage, a lot of coverage and moving too fast. Um, so there will be lots of snack and movement breaks built in to that day. Um, like I mentioned previously, students who opt into instrumental music will participate in that. We also have many online platforms that have been developed um, and Dr. Bisson has been a great resource and a support with this. Things like um, Keyboarding Without Tears or other programs that you're familiar with, but some new ones that we've added in too. Um, the ELA block, um, it could very much be something that the children brought home from school. Um, it could be a time too when uh, there might be, if a child is getting some reading support or earlier in the math block or at other times of the day when there's choice that a math interventionist might support a child or other services might take place. Lunch and movement through the day, quiet time is a part of our responsive classroom that we'd like to see um, continue as a part of the schedule at home. This could be independent reading or practice or some kind of choice activity. Science and social studies, of course, are an important part of our students' learning. And um, we'd like a lot of these activities to be more experiential and to perhaps be off the screen. Um, Google Classroom is still something the children will be using. When they're on their in-person days um, with their classroom teacher, they'll be having a lot of time to be able to uh, learn the different programs and to learn how to use their devices. Um, we're working to provide devices for children to use and so that those will be familiar for at the times when they are home. So hopefully as we go through this, they'll become more independent um, and require a little less assistance than perhaps they have in the past from people at home. And then the end of the day will still be 2.30. As we keep going, um, some of the things you might wanna consider and think about from the student perspective it are some of the things I just mentioned that, that services could happen on those days uh, kindergarten periods will be shorter in duration. Um, we are going to provide some materials for students to be able to take home. So, you know, the basic things that you might need in little kits that can go back and forth. Um, there will still be things that can be done on paper. Um, and so if there are children who are in school for four days, so some of our high needs students have been invited for four days of the week. Um, a question that has come up as we've gone through these schedules is, you know, will they still be able to participate in things like art, music, PE, and library? And yes, they will. We'll make sure that that happens within the schedule. And then on early release days, those are the days that the classroom teachers will be with the children uh, in more of that live model in the morning. Um, and then they'll set them up for some activities um, that could be uh, recorded in the afternoon. It could perhaps be PE. PE is something that typically happens twice during the week. So the children will have that live connection with the PE teacher of them, perhaps a recorded activity on a Wednesday. Um, and then in the afternoon, the teachers will be doing things like um, common planning time, um, meeting with um, professionals in the different curricular areas, or perhaps meeting with an administrator. Um, in order to do that work that we typically in an elementary schedule would have done on Tuesdays, um, but now we're shifting that day to Wednesday. 
Um, lunch will be made available to everyone on those days who need it. And um, it's wonderful that our food service has been, you know, really thinking long and hard about how to make sure that that still happens for kids. On the next slide. This is something that you've seen already. So this is just an example of what that hybrid model looks like, just to remind people that there are those AA and those BB days, um, and that Wednesday is that early release, uh, and that some students will be there um, for four days in our highest needs category. Some of the lessons will be live. Um, some will be those asynchronous recorded lessons. And something to think about with those live connections uh, on a computer too in any one of these models is that it doesn't necessarily mean um, that there's 40 minutes of straight time on the computer with the teacher. I think that that's something that we've discovered in our, in our research of remote learning is that shorter blocks of time in order to support students learning in small groups or to give really very targeted tasks that then the teacher is able to circle back around um, to support students with um, can be very powerful and can really advance the learning um, well in that remote world. Um, you'll see that in the in-person days, um, there are mask breaks, there are hand washing times. Um, and while it's not put into this schedule, and particularly because we still need to develop this, um, as someone mentioned previously, the developing of the very specifics of a schedule are things that we typically do with teachers at school and thank very much our teacher leaders who help to do that. Um, but those details will be put in and they will be outside as much as we possibly can um, because we think that's what's best for our students and the adults too. Um, so on the next slide, I believe, you will see um, the older students schedule. So second through fifth grade, this is the one that doesn't fit on one slide. <laughs> it's a little bit longer, um, but it follows the same pattern. Um, as the children get older, they're able to have a little bit more time um, with the larger group for longer periods of time um, and also be engaging much more within that Google Classroom um, in both models. All right, there hopefully will be time for some um, closing up and closing meetings at the end of the day and making sure that, again, that's a time when we wash hands and, you know, make sure that we have all of those materials that we need in order to, um, especially if it's the end of our AA or our BB session, to have what we need in order to work at home. And then the last slides are just reminders of those remote schedules that you've seen already, um, that they also follow that same kind of pattern, um, that there will be breaks um, and times in which children are encouraged uh, with activities to move, uh, to get outside, to have snack, to have lunch. Um, and of course, one of the benefits of that um, all fully remote learning is, and it has been mentioned, that um, the time isn't taken right, for masks and for washing hands. And I think that's something that people notice when they look at these schedules, and it's true. Um, and also that um, I just wanted to say before we move on to Gibbs, that there are pieces of the schedule too that are still flexible within the school buildings. Um, and I think that the amounts of times that we spend on different things as we get better about being in school together and following all of the new safety um, procedures and precautions will move faster. Um, it just will be new, uh, but kids are, you know, they're very flexible and they'll be able to, to learn these things and to um, move through them very quickly. And I think that will be true in the remote learning too. There may be things here that slow them down a little bit as they get used to fully learning online, but it will all come together as these two um, programs move through the same curriculum for elementary students. So thank you. Okay, um, so we're going to move into the Gibbs schedules, and then I'm going to ask uh, Madame uh, Fabian Pierre Maxwell to uh, present uh, the Gibbs schedule.
Thank you, Dr. Magnell. Good evening, everyone. So tonight I will be presenting two exemplars of student schedule. And the first one, it's the one that a student who's in the hybrid program would be a following. So uh, that means the student is in school for two days. Uh, in this example, Monday, Tuesday, the student will be in school. Wednesday, it's district-wide all synchronous day. And then Thursday, the student would be home on Thursday and Fridays. So um, the hi highlight of the schedule, we start every day in advisory, which is about 30 minutes, where students, 20 minutes, where students would be uh, having a social emotional check by their classroom teachers or other staff member would be a consistent part of that students group advisory uh, because when the students are home on Thursday and Friday, that partner that the classroom teacher would have in advisory would then be the person to start advisory with the students when they at home in the asynchronous days. Uh, noticing that we have still showcasing the seven block we shared the last time in the schedule. Um, this is a student simple schedule. So in this schedule that that students start the day uh, with science and then art and then Spanish, PE, math, ELA, and ancient civilization for social studies. And then in that student's win block, remember again, win means what I need for that student. That student would need math support. So that students will be receiving that in the win block. And notice that the, the, the schedule is identical, whether the student is in front of the teacher on the two days that they are live in the building and the two days that the student is learning remotely through going to um, Google Classroom for assignment or uh, doing assignment that the teacher may have discussed during the two days they were in school with that teacher. On Wednesday, we wanted to be more specific to what the day would look like on Wednesday. The first half of Wednesday will be a synchronous day where again, in the case of that students, I, we highlight on uh, the right side of the screen. Uh, again, they start with advisory, noticing the consistency in that student schedule. Uh, that's the plan they would have. The times would be much shorter because in the afternoon of that Wednesday, the students will be asynchronously, again, doing assignment that were scheduled and posted on Google Classroom or assignment that were discussed with the teacher uh, when they were live uh, that morning or the day before. Uh, so uh, the students will have lunch between the third and the fourth period block, uh, between 11 to 16 and 2 p.m. and 1 p.m., 1.30 p.m. And again, this will be placed in each student's schedule because the lunch schedule cover an extension of time and it's something that is worked out when uh, the whole staff come together to decide which learning community will go to lunch for a second and third. Um, thank you, Dr. Magnil. Could we go to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. And this is uh, a copy of our remote by choice schedule. Again, this in the schedule, uh, we're showcasing the same thing. The, the major difference is that it is a synchronous schedule, meaning that those students are learning from home every day of the week, the same half day on Wednesday, but then they have their teachers uh, on the screen for most of the time with them. Again, as it was pointed out by Principal Peretz, uh, the synchronous time does not mean that the student would be on the screen from 8.30 to the 2.56 where the school day end. Rather, the teachers will be communicating with each other. They would be collaborate, so they could be in sync. So they are not st starting any major units that would take the whole entire screen time at the same time on the same day. They will also communicate in regard to homework assignment. So the children are not receiving a heavy loaded of assignment every night. So, so that's the kind of communication the teachers will do uh, within the subject and vertically across the subjects to make sure that 
uh, there's a, a appropriate momentum, there's a, a time given for the students to learn and get used to the schedule, get used to how they're learning remotely, get used how to balance uh, the day when they are in the hybrid program. So this schedule represent perhaps a, a schedule of a student who received ELL service. You'll notice that there are seven block where they have what I need, what that students would need in the seventh block would be ELL support because this is an ELL student. Again, they would receive that consistent support throughout the seventh block and the Wednesday is highlighted on the side, it would be very similar. And the schedule is created in such a way that if we were to move completely from a hybrid to a completely remote schedule that it would not be anything to do but to rearrange the teachers in regard to the grouping because the whole building would then move to that all remote but you can see the schedules they are very similar and again as it was mentioned by principal Peretz, uh, there are some things you are not seeing on our schedule right now like when are they going to have their uh, mass break uh, when they're going to maybe transition elsewhere. Some of these housekeeping are things that we do when the teachers come together so we can uh, scaffold them appropriately, we can target them appropriately. So that's a conversation that happened within the learning communities and across the learning communities. So those schedules are shared, the liaison, the special education teachers, they will be meeting with those teachers again when school begins. So to make Make sure that as they pull students for a support that is required by their IEP or their ELL program, they're not creating a hole by not removing the student at a time the student needs to be learning something with the group. So there are some things that we will not be able to show until we have our staff and we'll have our staff as of this Wednesday so we can be planning and before we send actual schedule to our parents. Um, this is all for tonight, for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Pierre Maxwell. Uh, the next uh, schedule that we're going to present uh, is the Addison schedules, and I'm going to ask Mr. Maringer to uh, come and speak about those schedules. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, I'm gonna start off with the hybrid schedule. And this is uh, just kind of a, a general format in which you can see on Monday, if you were part of the AA cohort, you would have six periods. Then um, in those classes, I will show you in the next screen, but there are four main core classes for your learning community. That's math, science, social studies, and English. You also will have a special area subject that will rotate quarterly. That's technology, art, facts, or music. And then we have one class that is called the wind block that Madame talked about earlier. For many kids, that's when they'll get academic support if they're on an IEP. For other students, they'll be able to work on their world languages. On Wednesday, that is a kind of district-wide synchronous classes. So you will have six classes kind of very quickly that will last for about 25 minutes. And then when you're at home, you will take a world language, you will take maybe computer science, you might take um, band orchestra or chorus and PE. So if we can go to the next slide, please. This was just a, a mock-up schedule. So as you can see, when you're in class, you might have as an eighth grader, you might have algebra one, then science, then art. You might have then your lunch period. You might have your WIN slash academic support, ELA and civics. On the days that you're at home, you will have some asynchronous videos and assignments, but that might be where you're taking your French class, your PE, computer science, or band orchestra and chorus. So that's really the hybrid schedule. The, you know, the major pro is that you're in school for two days and you're in for classes, you're meeting synchronously on Wednesday and you are having one or two classes at home that will be synchronous along with some asynchronous assignments. Can we go to the next slide? And so this is really a teacher's view. So a teacher teaches five out of six classes when they are in person. So, and when they're in person on 
Monday, Tuesday, teaching cohort A and teaching cohort B on Thursday, Friday. Once again, synchronous is with everyone. So if you're a teacher, you're teaching in this schedules, period one, three, four, five, and six, you have period two off. And on the Wednesday, the AA and BB groups meet to see each other, and those classes will be about 22 to 24 students. So let's talk about the all remote schedule or the remote academy as we're calling it. So I really would like to thank some teachers and Dr. McNeil who did a little research over the summer. There was a bunch of um, teachers from the Audison, including Terry Dash, Polly Ford, R Rochelle Rubino, who's an assistant principal, um, Nikki Hochter and Nalu Hogan, who took a Harvard professional development course that was recommended to them by Dr. McNeil. Then they met with a couple other teachers, uh, Susan Stewart and Corey Smith, among a couple of other people, to really look at what was successful for remote learning. So I did want to take this opportunity just to say that there were teachers working hard on this schedule, and I wanted to go over this just a little bit. So what would happen is that on Monday, periods one, four, and five, and I'll show you more substantially on the next slide, one, four, and five are live. Teachers are expected to be in a 45 minute class teaching students. Periods two, three, six, and seven, teachers are available, but they're not live teaching. Then on Tuesday, two, three, six, and seven have live 45 minute classes, but teachers are available one, four, and five. So if I can go to the next slide, I hopefully can explain this a little bit better. So let's say your son or daughter has this for a schedule. On Monday, they would go to science, ELA, and algebra. They would have 45 minute classes. The facts teacher, the Spanish teacher, and the civics teachers are all available during those times while you're working on asynchronous material. Tuesday, your science teacher is still available first period, but they're not teaching a 45 minute live class. They're there to answer questions about the asynchronous learning. Then you can go to PE, you can go to facts, which are live, you, go to, you have a break for lunch. Then ELA and algebra right there, you're working on asynchronous classes, but your teachers are available. And then you have live Spanish and civics. The reason behind this was we wanted to make sure that there was a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning. For many of you at home, we've been on for about two class worth of time. So if you're right now and you've spent an hour and a half listening to the school committee, that's about two courses that your kids have gone through. If you are in rapt attention, fantastic. If some of you have drifted off a little bit, there's a chance that you can understand what kids are gonna go through if you're looking to have six or seven 45 minute synchronous courses. So when Dr. McNeil and the different teachers took the PD, they really found that looking at different models, that it was really successful if you had a mix between synchronous and asynchronous on the same day, and that you didn't have kids really on screen time from 8.45 to three o'clock. So just go to the next schedule. Please, thank you. So from a teacher's point of view, this could be a teacher's view where first period on Monday, they're teaching synchronous, but on Tuesday, they're still available. Wednesday, synchronous. Thursday, synchronous. On Friday, available for small group and individual help. Then period two, they're, they're off. Period three, they're on, once again. So three out of five days, they're teaching live lessons, and the other two, they're available for help at that time. And in looking at some of the models that they looked at, it was seen as real successful because teachers could give outreach to certain kids to meet with them at that time in the class. And kids knew when they were doing asynchronous work, they could talk to their teachers if they had questions at that time. One of the big questions that um, I know school committee was very concerned with, and I know parents were very concerned with, is in the remote schedule, could they get world languages? And originally I said, I didn't know. And I didn't want to overpromise and under deliver. But it looks like right now that all world language classes will be taught by Audison teachers, no matter if you are in the hybrid or you are in the all remote schedule. We are also looking to, we have 
four quarterly classes and we're looking to be able to rotate those in. So once again, we are thinking as of now, art, music, technology, and art technology and facts will be able to be taught quarterly by Audison teachers. So we think that we're gonna be able to give people the best and things on, things on the ground still might change. There's still some negotiation and other things that are happening. But for the most part, we are trying to make the schedule for both the 300 kids who picked the all remote, the best possible education, and for the 620 kids or so that have picked the hybrid. And we're looking at doing things to the best of our ability. The last thing I did wanna tell is the remote students. I did talk to both the orchestra and band teacher, and they are gonna have one session from three to 3.45 on Wednesdays so that they can meet with the orchestra and band kids who have picked the remote schedule. And I think that's my last slide, Dr. McNeil. Excellent, yes, thank yes you. Yes, it is, yes it is. So uh, we're gonna move into Arlington High School. And so I'm gonna ask Dr. Matthew Janger to present the schedules uh, and to talk about the, if there's been any updates since the last time he has presented the schedules to school committee. Dr. Janger. Um, sure, so you can jump to the first visual. Um, so I've been gone through all these other things. I feel like my picture looks very simple. Um, but there's an awful lot of complexity behind that. There haven't been really significant changes. We've been sticking to the same basic model and refining the options and the actual schedule within. It's worthwhile to realize that, you know, in the course of a high school year, we teach over 500 classes. So in this sort of simple seven or eight slots, there's a huge variety in the complexities in the individual kids and their motion through it. So the basic plan at the high school has been to have a common four by four semesterized schedule, whether students were in the all remote option or in the hybrid option. And just to be clear, when I refer to the hybrid option, even the hybrid option this year is proposed to start remotely. So because of the ventilation issues, because of small classrooms, because we're working through having enough classroom space um, to be able to accommodate all of the classes in the hybrid option, we're not able to start right away. And I do wanna echo something Dr. Bodhi said earlier. The issue with ventilation is not that the high school is not a safe place to be. The issue is that if the ventilation in a classroom is not working at its full capacity, then it's not necessarily able to hold the full capacity of students. So if I have a class where it could hold 10 students six feet apart, but I don't know that the AC is working, I'm not able to ensure that that space is safe to have that full co cohort of kids. It doesn't mean that two or three or five kids can't be in there. And at this point, um, the facilities department has cleared large portions of the school, but if I don't have a gym, if I don't have even five or 10% of the classrooms, I still can't offer the full hybrid option. Right now in the schedule that we've done with room capacities in there, assuming ventilation and with classrooms that we know won't be usable, taken out of service, um, we're functioning about 90 to 95%. And that's even with a schedule, which gives us about 15% more classroom slots than we had in previous years. And that's because of the small number of seats allowed in classrooms. We have some classes where we can only have nine kids at a time, six feet apart. Nine kids at a time, six feet apart means I need to set class size for 18. And so we are very tight in terms of just the number of actual seats that we can schedule in. And um, I've sent that information, which was requested by the facilities committee to Dr. Bodie, both on um, sections that we don't have enough seats for, and then the capacity of all the classrooms and which ones we currently know are out of service and which ones are not. But that's one of the issues we have to work through. So the four by four semesterized model. So the idea here is that students are only taking three or four classes at a time, but they're taking them for twice as much time. And this is a common schedule that's used in schools around the country. It's used in Cambridge. Um, and so you, you focus on depth over breadth. So the advantage of that is that students don't have to focus on a large number of classes that they need to keep track of when they're functioning remotely, because we know there's a real strain on executive function when the students are at home for a lot more of their day. 
It also means the teachers are focusing on a much smaller number of students and have a smaller number of classes to prepare. And given that there's a lot of grading associated with um, remote instruction and that there's an odd preparation with this whole new approach, and we want a student to be able to focus on following up with 40 to 60 kids, not 100 to 120 kids, um, this model seemed like a really positive way to go. So it's fairly simple. Um, a student would be taking, um, if you want to just skip down for a sec to the next slide, Dr. McNeil, and then I'll skip back up. So a student might, for example, this is not the schedule that anyone would necessarily get, be taking their English, their math, and an elective in the first quarter. I'm sorry, in the first term, sort of that, let's try that again. First semester, the first semester is half the year, that's term one and term two. Um, so they'd be taking English, math, and an elective, and they might for the second half of the year be taking, say, history, science, a world language, and some other elective. If their elective was a band or chorus, they might be taking it in both the D and H spot all the way across. Um, if they had an academic support, there would be room in there as well. So the idea then, if the student is taking those three classes, is, can you skip back up to the last one? So now they're in their A block, they're in an English class. It's been decided district-wide in order to accommodate families and teachers and other schedules to have the cohort model be Monday, Tuesday for cohort one and Thursday, Friday for cohort two. So in this plan, you'd be focusing on in, now let's jump back to the all remote model. This teacher is gonna take attendance for their whole 20, 25 students during A block, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. They're gonna work primarily in terms of contact with the students who are in cohort one. And so that would be what I'm calling a seminar or a tutorial where they're focusing a lot of their teacher attention on one group of students. The other group of students, they're gonna to set to what we've been calling structured learning. So that's video work, independent work, group work, other activities that they're setting the students on and that are gonna be due during that class period. So they're working with one cohort on Monday and Tuesday, primarily with the students, the other students working independently. And then on Thursday, Friday, they switch cohorts and one half of the class is working independently and the other half of the class is working more with the teachers. So that's the basic structure. And then the students would go through three or four of those periods, depending on how full a schedule they had in the course of a day. And then we have Wednesdays. So there are things we've taken out of the general schedule in order to simplify it and in order to provide more space and time for those other classes. So PE has gone all remote because we don't have the gym spaces um, and the locker room spaces to accommodate activities within the school. So they're gonna meet with their classes for 45 minutes. We're, that's where we're setting it right now. Um, each PE teacher is teaching about four classes at a time. So they'd be teaching the, uh, the freshmen will go all year in one of those slots, and then they'll teach their other quarter electives. They'll meet with their whole group in each class for the 45 minute period. And then they'll arrange with all the students in the class to meet with them in small groups based on their individual schedules as kind of personal trainers to coach them and follow through. And then the students will do what we've called a PE contract, something we've done in the past where they're journaling on their activities that they're doing independently and working with the PE teachers and reporting on them. We'll then have advisory, which is gonna be for all students. Advisory is something we've done for many years. It's the only group, if you think about it, where the students are going back in with a group of kids and a teacher that they've met with on a regular basis. And we'll use advisory as the basis of our freshman um, orientation program. So the advisory will be about 30 minutes. The plan this year to give it some more structure is to have sort of two key components, um, attendance, some sort of video or activity or sharing of information, then some kind of an exit ticket, which makes sure kids paid attention, and then conversations within the group. And participate, as long as students attend and participate, do the exit tickets, that'll be a one credit activity. So it'll be pass fail. And then the last is X block or counseling. We've had X block again now for about five years and the teachers um, and the staff have made an enormous amount of uh, use of it. We've done it in slightly different ways over the course of each year. 
Last year, we had a rotating priority block. So math department would have uh, priority over um, X block one week, then English another week, then history another week. But any student could meet in office hours with any teacher, but the math teachers, for example, in their priority could require that the students meet with them. And we found that there was a really very heavy use of that as a time when kids knew that they were on call, they were expected to come meet with the folks, um, and also when the staff knew that they could expect to get kids. And so if you walked into the math department when the math department had their priority X block, there were five kids receiving extra help in every classroom. Now at the same time, our counseling department has seminars where they meet with students um, by grade level, sometimes the entire grade, sometimes small groups. And they've asked us to put a schedule in for that as well. So that one hour is gonna do a lot of work. We'll actually have a schedule probably by grade level, by priority for departments and by counseling activities. And then in the midst of all that, usually folks make a lot of use of that for club meetings as well. Um, then the district wide is planning on doing um, PD um, because there's an enormous amount of planning that's gonna be going into this. And then our staff meeting time by contract has to start before 2.45 in order to go till after school and we move the start time. So that's why the slightly early slot is there as well. Um, so I feel like other people said a lot more things and I have more notes here, but I'll stop there. Thank you. So I would like to thank all the building administrators uh, for presenting today. Uh, this is the product of a lot of discussion, a lot of meetings. Uh, as uh, someone stated earlier, we had the synchronous study groups that were meeting at the elementary level and secondary level. So we had teacher input. So the, the, what you're seeing is just literally, you know, I can't even quantify the number of hours that have gone into trying to make sure that we are applying best practice and using research in order to provide the best learning experience in all of the models for our students. So I'm going to... Dr. Mill, can I jump back in? I knew there was one more thing sure. I had written down small here. So sure. I just wanted to also talk about how the difference is between the phase remote, which will start all remote, and the student, those students who chose the all remote option. So in the all remote option, we only had about 170 requests. Um, and so uh, some folks have commented that we're not able to offer as wide a range of options. So you need to understand that at Arlington High School, we offer, for example, 17 different uh, AP courses, um, and I don't even know how many different electives. And with only, with fewer than 80 students in the junior and senior class, having selected the all remote option, it's, it's not possible that we're gonna be able to individually staff those AP classes. The core classes, all of those classes will be staffed with Arlington teachers. They'll follow the same schedule on the same basic model as I just described for the beginning of the phase remote. Um, PE, advisory, X block, um, I'm sorry, PE, advisory, world language, music and computer science will be all remote for all. So those students that are in the all remote academy will be doing that with the students who are in the phase remote hybrid. Um, and then what we're doing really is going through looking at the course requests of those 170 students and seeing what clusters of interest and need there are and we'll figure out what we can do in terms of staffing um, or supporting those different activities so thank you for that thank you for that additional explanation so i'm going to send it back over to dr Bodie to see if she has any or more comments and then we can definitely take questions or comments on the schedules um the only thing, I, I actually have a few more things to add, but I just want to also mention with the high school that um, the recommendation is that just for planning purposes is that we have a decision point at the end of October um, when we decide when we're able to, to move back into a hybrid model. There'll be a transition time of a couple of weeks, but I think that um, we're going to start the year with that recommendation and with the, uh, the goal of getting the students back into a hybrid model. Uh, Dr. Janger, do you want to mention about athletics this year? Yes, but it's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little afraid because the details are pretty complicated, but yes, yeah, so the plan right now with athletics is voted by the MIAA. 
um, is that there will be a fall season. It will be a limited season. Um, and it will be limited essentially to outdoor non-contact sports. So, um, and then they're going to add an extra season um, later in the year, which is called fall two, which is actually in the winter um, for those sports that they were not able to offer in the fall. So we'll be starting out, I might not get this exactly right, but it's written in the FAQ. Um, soccer, field hockey, um, cross country, and I'm forgetting one. Soccer, field hockey, cross country, oh. and golf. golf. There you go. Golf. Uh, four sports that will start in the fall. And they'll run a limited competition schedule, um, and they'll be entirely outside until we can get access to any gyms or locker rooms for changing. Um, but that's the plan. So th those ones will meet in the fall with some modifications for distancing to the programs. Um, and then they'll go through the other seasons. And the ones that were taken out of the fall swimming football um, will be in fall too. So that's the basic plan. We're pretty excited about that. And one of the other things is they'll limit competition sizes. But I talked to Dr. Bower today and we really want to encourage, this isn't something I've talked to Dr. Bodie about, but we, we really want to encourage as many kids as possible to participate in those teams and that we'll find sort of intramural ways um, and squad ways to create a competitive environment, even if they're not able to participate in the full competitions because they're limiting the numbers there. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, uh, it might be better if there's any questions before I go on to which, which are related to the reopening plan, but are not necessarily related to schedules. If there's any comments or questions the committee had. Yeah, I think that's probably good. Um, so uh, Ms. Exton, there you are. Um, well, I, first, I just want to say thank you to all of you for all the work that um, has gone into this planning. Um, I especially appreciate the work that the principals and teachers have done um, and the details that you've refined on these schedules, um, especially um, the slides tonight, Dr. McNeil, um, it would be great if they could be shared. Um, I wanted to thank um, Mr. Feeney and his team for all the work that they have done in all the buildings to get them um, up and ready um, for our students. I know that that has not been an easy um, task. Uh, I also wanted to thank Dr. Bodie um, and Christine Bongiorno and the Board of Health for the work that they have done to get the testing um, organized for teachers um, and for our the town for funding that testing. Um, that's not something that's happening everywhere and I really appreciate the work that that went into that. Um, I also I just I want to acknowledge um, the teachers concerns about um, going back to school. Um, I know that there are a lot more questions than there are answers. I know um, that there are a lot of concerns around developing relationships with students, the complexities of the hybrid schedule, um, the challenges of managing classrooms in a new way, concerns about workload and expectations in a new teaching model, um, the need for even more collaboration time with more specialists and more um, coaches and curriculum leaders. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel all of that um, as well. And I, I think it's important that we that we acknowledge that teachers are feeling that way. Um, we're asking them to do a lot of things that they haven't had to do before and um, in ways that are counter to a lot of what we all know about good pedagogy. Um, and while I continue to support the hybrid model and as I said before, the work that has gone into the scheduling and how they've been refined um, has taken a lot of work and I really appreciate all of that. Um, but I just hope, you know, we continue um, going forward to continue to take um, teachers' perspectives and feedback um, and thoughts into account um, and continue as school starts and students come into our building that we continue to um, listen to teachers and hear what's going well and what's not working and how we can continue to support them um, in the things that are, that are happening um, in this daily ever-changing um, 
environment that that we're all about to embark on. Um, so that I, I wanted to say that. Um, and then I guess in terms of my questions are are more about the schedule. So if we're waiting on on that, I can do that. Um, Miss Morgan. No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so along the lines of what I sort of said about teachers, the um, the remote teaching schedule and the hybrid teaching schedule um, feel really un, uneven in terms of teacher role. And I realize maybe we can't talk about that um, here at a public meeting, but um, I just, I wanted to put that out there. Um, it feels like um, in the hybrid schedule, um, it's an extra period, one less prep time, um, being in a building in a mask and a face shield. Um, so whether or not there can be an answer to that or if you just wanna acknowledge that I mentioned it, but that's, that's really my biggest question right now. So can you just, can you ask that again? Cause I just wanna make sure that we're responding to what, what you need, what you're um, asking. So I, I'm just in the, in the OMS, um, all remote schedule from the teacher perspective, um, it looks like there are two prep times. Um, they see students, they're available for students every other day. Um, and then in the hybrid schedule at OMS, um, they are live in person with students six out of seven periods a day. So there's one prep time period. Um, and they are in a building, in a mask, in a face shield um, with students. And so I just, um, again, I, there's been so much work on the schedule already, um, but, but that stood out to me when you presented those two teacher perspective schedules. Uh, Mr. Manager, did you wanna comment on that? Sure. Um, no, I think you're reading that 100% correctly. Um, the issue is that you usually have seven classes a day at the middle school. And because two of the seven couldn't meet during in-person because they would cross-contaminate cohorts, really what happened is you had seven classes, you had five meeting on one day and two meeting on the other day. And really the only way that you could get special education services on the end day was to have a win block. So I, I agree. I do feel like there is a little bit more on the teachers who are in school than the teachers that are out of school. Although it might be offset by the fact that the teachers who are doing the all remote it's a little bit more tech savvy that you have to be, where if you are in school, you're doing a little bit more in person, which is more familiar for a lot more teachers. So there is a little bit of that balance. I found that a lot of teachers who wanted the, you know, remote academy tended to be more of our tech savvy teachers, where teachers who sometimes maybe weren't as comfortable, wanted more of the hybrid. That's an overgeneralization. There's plenty of teachers who are in the hybrid who are gonna be great with technology. But I do agree, there is a little inequity, um, but it's really the only way we could look at it because of trying to keep the cohort separate. But I, I agree with your main point. Thanks, and I, I would just follow up that I hope as the as school starts, um, we continue to get feedback from teachers about how that's feeling um, for them in terms of workload and managing things. Yes, I agree. And I think that's why that Wednesday afternoon professional development is gonna be important for teachers to be able to have time to meet and hopefully collaborate on things. And that's why I hope well, that we'll have time. May I just add a comment to that too, That there that is there is differences there's definitely pros and cons to both schedules one thing that would might be is hoped for is that when a teacher in the remote program is teaching synchronously they're teaching the whole class so there's not the same opportunity to have smaller groups unless you you build that in 
And I think that those times when there's, there's it's it's being available, but it's really an opportunity to have smaller groups from that from that class um, meet. Whereas in our hybrid program in the middle school, classes are going to be relatively small, um, just because we're limited to the size of the classroom. So it it's uh, it's trying to uh, keep a balance in terms of uh, you know that that piece of it as well. Thanks. I'll set Ms. Morgan. Uh, Mr. Carden. Uh, thank you. Um, so I want to echo Ms. Exton's uh, thanks for the, the hard work. Um, we've seen a lot of progress on the schedules. Uh, Dr. McNeil, if we could get that presentation, you could send it to Karen. I think she could up, actually upload it while we're here. It's still in that, it's still in that would be helpful to people. If not, put it on the web, you know, also put it on the website. Um, so um, yes, I will. yes. I also I will. want to you know, acknowledge the concern that we've heard from from teachers. Um, you know, this this was a decision based on a, a recommendation of the administrative team, uh, and I also, as Ms. Exton said, encourage the admin team to continue to listen to the teachers. Uh, I know there's been a lot of conversation uh, that has been happening, and uh, as the details further evolve, there will be more chance for uh, teachers to have input. But I think what the administrative team recommended and what we supported was the basic outline of a hybrid plan, which has two days in school, one half synchronous day and two days remote. Um, the exact details of how that all works is messy. It's messy in every single district that's doing it. Hundreds of districts are doing it. We're all struggling to figure it out, but that doesn't mean we, we abandon ship and, 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 and not implement it or put it off to some uncertain date in the future when everything's nice and perfect. So we've got nine professional development days coming for this all to be sorted out. And I, I, I do believe that um, with some effort, uh, we can get it done. And uh, I support the administrative team in continuing to do that. Um, my one question was about the teacher assignments. My understanding was that there actually were um, some teachers who had originally requested a remote um, academy position uh, and may have withdrawn that request or some that were offered the remote academy position and, uh, and, and decided to come in to hybrid instead. Um, is, is that correct? Um, yes, it is. Great. So, you know, obviously there are a lot of teachers, understandably, who are very concerned about the hybrid model but there are also that are some some that are voluntarily switching into it. So, um, you know, just for the greater community, um, I just wanted to make that point. Uh, and then finally, um, just uh, at the the middle middle school schedule, Mr. Merringer, um, you know, on the on the teacher side, you did you did note that there's um, on those async for the for the fully remote program. When the teacher is in the asynchronous mode, sorry, sorry, not the the not live mode, um, the teacher is available. But there's also a possibility for small group work. Um, and I actually would, as as you meet with the teachers, I would encourage. And we've had this discussion before in subcommittee. I would encourage you know more focus on the small group work um, because it's somewhat unlikely that middle schoolers are going to reach out to their teacher. Um, if they have a question. Some, a small portion will, um, but it might be more effective for the teacher to schedule, you know, 10 minute check-ins with, with four or five students at a time. Um, and again, that's a, that's a detail that the teacher should be definitely deciding, but I do hope that, that we encourage teachers to do that. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Cardin, I totally agree. I, I had, um, uh, there was a science teacher in eighth grade who really did a lot of feedback last year and got a lot of surveys from students. And she felt like 70% to 75% of the kids did fairly well in kind of the remote learning when they had it in April and May. And she said it was trying to keep the 25 to 30% of the kids really engaged. And she found having that extra time was when she could really connect with kids, make sure that they were learning and engaged. So I think the teachers are looking at that time as 
there's going to be a lot of kids who get asynchronous work and are independent and going to do a great job. But there's other kids that they're really going to have to keep after. And so I don't believe that the teachers are looking at that as kind of like, a, you know, a college course where they're like, oh, well, I had office hours and you should have stopped by. I think they're really looking at it as here are the kids that we really need to make sure that we connect with and that we have a chance to reach out because there are a lot of kids who come home, do their homework and are self-motivated and independent. And there are some other kids that struggle with executive functioning and are going to need a little bit more. So I know the teachers who designed that, one of their impact was we're really going to be able to catch those kids that or might fall through the cracks if we have those days. So I, I share your same concerns. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. And, and Mr. Carr, and I, I definitely will make sure that we uh, post the slide deck and I will give it to uh, Karen so she can um, share it with everybody. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Hi. Thank you all. Um, thank you very, I echo the thanks that Mr. Carden and Ms. Exton have said. Um, to save time, I won't go into it, but I really do appreciate all the work that everyone's put into this, both uh, administration and all of our other staff. Um, I have two kind of questions. First, I'm thinking about the parents of our kindergartners to maybe grade two and about the schedule that I saw actually for either the remote or the, the hybrid, the remote section of the hybrid. And I understand that we're trying to, to give them screen breaks and stuff, but I'm thinking as a parent, especially if I'm trying to work a job at the same time, coordinating when the kid's supposed to be on, off, back on, off again. I, I mean, I'd have a hard time scheduling it for myself. I'd have to set up alarms or something. And I'm concerned about how well it's going to go. Um, I personally wonder if, I, I understand that we're trying to meet the time on learning as specified by DESI, but I really feel like for remote things, I'm questioning whether the hour, the, the normal length of our school day appropriately translates to the correct amount for a remote school day um, and whether there's any way to petition or something to decrease this because I just feel like it's going to be really hard for parents to accomplish and help their children achieve and that, that's what we're going to be asking them to do. Um, so uh, maybe I'll stop there and hear it. So I'm, I'm going to yield that to Dr. Bodie because, you know, structurally, this is what we have recommended. And, you know, we've always said along the way that there's going to be pros and cons to each schedule. So some of it is just inherent. So, you know, it, are you asking, I just want to make sure that I understand what you're asking. Are you asking us to consider the length of the day or like, what, what are you, what are you proposing in, in your question? I'm saying, I don't see how parents are going to make this work for a lot of kids or for their family set up both. And, and it's not just one schedule or the other. It's the remote. It's, it's all the remote day. I mean, all the remote school or the remote sections of the hybrid portion. And maybe everyone else is much more organized and is going to be able to do this. Okay, Johnny has to be looking at the screen at 10 and then oh oops time to take them off the screen here johnny go do the, oh no come back you have to come back it's time for english now i just think this is going to be really hard <laughs> and i feel like i understand that we're supposed to be doing the same time on learning but i don't think it's necessarily what we're coming up with does not sound like potential best practice for doing remote schooling for someone who's in kindergarten to grade two or three. I'm not sure where the cutoff would be, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, it's not so much a specific question. It's, I don't see how this is gonna work. 
Well, I, I don't disagree with you that this is going to be challenging for parents. It's going to be challenging for little kids um, that are only um, at grades, kindergarten and first grade. I think that there's a, we're also going to be having a hybrid class, a remote class for our preschool as well. Though I will say the, that last year went quite well, but their day isn't as long either. And I think this is something that we're going to have to be um, monitoring for sure. And, and I don't think that anybody should think that these schedules right now are just locked in cement because I do think we have to be responsive as we go along to how this is working. And you know, one of the things we've talked about this summer is, is how do we get that kind of parental feedback, um, for that matter, student feedback as we, as we do this. And you're absolutely correct that regardless of whether you're in the hybrid plan or the remote academy plan, we're, we're gonna be asking a lot for our young, our young children. So we, we do have this requirement for time and learning. Um, but we also know that, you know, we can, we're trying to make it work in a way that is a little bit more student friendly, but I, I do think we just have to wait and see how this, this plays itself out. And I know Ms. Exton teaches kindergarten and she's going to probably see how it's working on, you know, for, for her class as well, but it's going to be a challenge. And I, I understand, um, the challenge for parents. Um, I see this with my own children, uh, the, the challenges that they're going to be facing as they face this year as well. Thank you. I guess part of it is just as you're doing it, if there's any way that the software, you know, the, the stuff that's being used, the tools can help with doing the transition so that there's perhaps less parental input, that would be helpful. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I, I think using Seesaw will be a big improvement over just using Google Classroom for that for that grade uh, this year. But again, we'll be monitoring that as well. Okay. Um, and then my second question was, I too have been listening very hard to the teachers. I've been circumspect in what I say because of our ongoing negotiation. Um, but one thing that would be helpful for me is for us, and by this I mean all of us, both administration, teachers, school committee, if we can try and boil some of the teacher concerns down into problems that can be solved. So just for two examples, there's concerns about ways of, there's concerns that students won't be able to collaborate when they're sitting in their classroom in the hybrid situation. So that seems like a problem that we can solve. Is there a way for the kids who are sitting, you know, in their rows to be able to collaborate with each other even without moving next to each other? Um, another problem is how can we decrease, I'm calling it mental load, the mental load on the hybrid teachers. Um, is there ways that we can offset that so that we can make balance the load better among our staff? So that that's not really a question but it's a comment thank you um mr delman thank you um so i i want to echo what ms eggs instead to start this conversation i think you know i want to i want to congratulate and commend the uh, principals for a thoughtful and collaborative approach to planning i mean they put a lot of time into this a lot of thinking into this and uh <clears throat> i'm grateful for all the time they put in the summer I would say that, as Dr. Bodhi said earlier, we're going to learn a lot as we go. And I think we have to be prepared to pivot as we get new information and new data on, on the, the degree to which students are learning in each model. So I, I, I think that's what we're going to have to be prepared to do. And I think the administrative team is prepared to do that. On the <clears throat> topic of the high school, I heard Dr. Janger say that he has given a report to Dr. Bodhi on uh, the questions the facilities subcommittee uh, asked last week about capacity of all the rooms in the high school and some other questions that we had. So we, we would really like to get that report. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, whenever that's ready, I yeah, know- it, we'll, it, we'll get it to the facilities committee, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you very much. I know you're very busy. So yeah, I'd like to get that report. Um, 
And that's it. I don't really have anything else to add. I know, I know we're getting, you know, when you get into a conversation, just for the public's benefit, when you get into a conversation about schedule, you're actually, you're really bordering on a conversation about negotiation. So I think um, I'm not going to say anything else. And I, uh, I hear what the teachers are saying. And, uh, and uh, I, I commend the principals for the hard work they, they've done in putting together this schedule. Thank you. Um, Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I also want to commend everybody for their work. Uh, look, as, as somebody who's scheduled schools uh, and has done a lot of the logistical stuff that uh, is being attempted, I think that we're dealing with something that's extraordinarily difficult, bordering and impossible. And I, I commend everybody's efforts. Um, I don't want to go into more detail in that direction because I have you know, because the email from Mr. Hainer that he's uh, maybe putting forth a motion later in the meeting. But I do want to ask a, que a specific question and put this out for the entire community. I know that we've got a few hundred people watching right now, and I hope the word spreads. I have heard from several parents who are submitting plans to withdraw their children from the district to homeschool based on what they're been seen. Now, I, I want to note that our 2021-22 or fiscal 22 state aid level is based on our enrollment on October 1, 2020. So that for parents who are looking to have a seat in the school, uh, the subsequent school year, not 2021, but 2122, the state funding for that seat is based on who was enrolled in our district on October 1, 2020. So please start with us and make, if, if you feel the need to go to a homeschool model and withdraw from the system for a year, please wait until after October to make that decision and, and try, try out what we're, we're doing for you. Uh, don't, be quick to pull a kid out of the school system right now because even though I disagree with the strategy that we're using right now, I think that we've got talented educators here in Arlington who are trying their best to present a good outcome and will be flexible in, in making things work for every child in the district. And that's where I'll stop right now. Uh, Mr. Hainer. As everyone said before me, I appreciate for all the work that uh, everyone has put into this. And for what I might do later on, I want everyone to know it is not a reflection on the administration, the teachers, or anything else. I have undergone a tremendous struggle hearing from parents, hearing from teachers, and seeing all the things that are going on. I'd like to ask a couple of administrative questions right now. Have all the teachers that have requested remote or hybrid been notified? Um, we have, yes, well, we have notified classroom teachers at this point. We haven't notified everybody, but yes, emails went out today. Um, and we still have more to consider tomorrow. But the idea is that we will respond to everybody uh, before Wednesday. Thank but, you. But, every, but really, the, the people who have asked, classroom teachers, who have asked for... Um, a remote schedule have been assigned to a remote schedule. They've all, all those that have requested it have been honored? All the classroom teachers that have requested, um, there, and there are, let me just say this, there's a, a couple of choices some people have to make about changing grade levels. So those, those decisions haven't been made yet, but the, the people who have been classroom teachers have been offered a, a remote schedule, yes. Okay, the other question I have, uh, during, uh, I don't remember whether it was uh, budget or one of the other, or curriculum, but there was a concern about staffing. Have we been successful in getting uh, substitute teachers or uh, aides, the additional staff that we were considering? We have budgeted for an additional, certainly more, more staffing than we have right now. And we have not reached the, the number that we would like to have. 
Um, we have been expanding the different ways that we are advertising for, uh, for teaching assistance. And uh, I suspect that we will be continuing to hire all the way through September as we move forward. I don't wish to speak for the entire committee, but I heard a consensus the other day, it's my opinion, that if you, if because of where we are in salary schedules and, and lack of competitiveness in surrounding areas, if that becomes an issue, I think it's important that we are notified to support you in any way to, to, to eliminate that restraint. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask the chair um, when it is appropriate, I have a motion to make. Okay, why don't I do my questions and then we can come back to that. Right. Um, Ms. Morgan, can I finish going through my report? Or, or for the, I wanted a chance to ask my question. Yeah, no, 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 I'm going to ask your question. Is that possible? Sure. Okay. Yep. Um, so I'm going to be brief. Um, I think uh, I appreciate what um, Mr. Miringer was able to share with us about the definition of this term available that's part of the, the um, the remote academy schedule at the Audison. And um, I just encourage you, and I, it sounds like you are, to continue to flush out what that definition means to faculty and staff once they're um, you know, back in whatever capacity, um, you know, whether you're um, meeting, you know, in whatever way you're meeting with them to sort of keep uh, keep working at that definition. Um, I know it doesn't, lots of words don't fit into a box in a schedule very well, but um, I, I, I think that they, I know that they'll have great ideas and, and you seem really open to thinking about that and talking about that with them. So um, that's really good to hear. Um, the one question I had for you, Mr. Miringer, how is Aspire synchronous on remote days for hybrid? Is like, is it their same Aspire person or we don't know yet? So it depends who your Aspire is. That's okay. the person that you will be assigned to. So most of the Aspire in the hybrid is gonna be who your first period class is because we felt that it was one less change. Right. But in the, in the remote only, it will be your first period teacher that will also be the Aspire because we're thinking that's one less click that you have to, that you have to go to. Got it. Okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, just, you know, echoing what Dr. Allison Ampey said, you know, I have a, I have a seven year old and I'm not, uh, I've, I've told his principal this already. So I'm not breaking confidence here that, I, I feel really good about that 810 attendance check. Like, I really think we're gonna be able to do that. Um, I feel really iffy <laughs> about the second one. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about that. I'm, I, I'm hoping it can be, and this is just feedback to all the elementary principals, if it can be like at least the same time every day. Like if it's like, like he's seven and has no idea what a period is, or what 125 means. He can't tell time on an analog clock yet. I think he's gonna learn that in second grade, I hope, um, but he can't do it now. So um, that makes me nervous, but I feel really solid about 810 um, and we're gonna start there. Um, but to the extent that that can be really predictable um, for families so that we can hit that that second one, that would be super for us. Um, and the other feedback I just had for, um, for Madame Pierre Maxwell, I, I really appreciate the uh, fluidity of the remote academy periods at the Gibbs. Um, I think that it, it sounds exciting. I'm, I'm a little concerned about the amount of work it will be for, um, for, for LC teachers to help make those decisions about what's gonna be synchronous and what's gonna be asynchronous. Like we, we have like two situations, right? We have the Audison that's, that's quite prescriptive, although we've got this availability piece that we're still working on, which is good. Um, but at the Gibbs, we have all, we have all these periods, four days. Um, and, and I'm, 
I'm curious and I'm looking forward to hearing how it works for teachers to, to think through whether ELA is synchronous this day and math is synchronous the next day. Um, so I'm just, I'm looking forward to hearing more. I don't really need to, I, I know that, you know, at this point, we know what we know, um, but I'm, I'm interested to see how those decisions will be made um, by, by teachers and teams of teachers. So that's definitely something I want to hear about more um, in the future. So um, I think that's it. I guess I didn't only had a question for Mr. Maringer. So um, yeah. So uh, Dr. Bodhi, did you want to finish? Well, yes, I, I would, if you wouldn't mind, because you, you had a motion the last time that had many parts to it. And um, one of the parts of it, um, we already talked about the high school and the revised reentry plan is what is ongoing. The recommendation remains the same as I have said already. But then we move on. There are also um, a criteria informed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or some other recognized health authority to, based on public health metrics to determine the model in-person, hybrid, or remote. So the Department of Public Health created a, a chart, which I have um, shared with all of you, that gives us metrics in terms of actually colored zones. But the one thing I would like to say about that, uh, and, that and it was then um, used by the Department of Education to talk about if you're in, in the white zone, green, yellow, red, what that would mean in terms of one of these programs. But the thing that I, I do want to say, and the Board of Health would, um, would echo this, that uh, the Department of Public Health thought of this only as a tool, that there are, there are so many situations that could arise that the tool is only going to help in some ways. Um, the, the Arlington Board of Health and the Arlington Public Schools are continuing to work together to create more language around some of these, but even with that work that we are doing, uh, it's going to be hard to cover every situation. Um, so I just wanna, I wanna just give that caveat to this, but um, just know that we are in communication with our local board of health, which is actually going to be the uh, partner as we think through these, as well as you know, consulting with DPH or, or DESE as we move forward. Um, but right now, um, Arlington remains a very low incident community. Um, it, we still are point, less than 0.5 cases on a seven day average. And if you look at that, that metric, you know, the, the, you, you start moving through that, but it's been, the, the Arlington incidents remain very stable over the last um, couple months. So, but we will be watching that very closely. That was one issue. So you have the chart, but as I said, it's, there's more. There's going to be more nuance and more discussion that's going to go forward. Um, I also want to report that you know this already that we received the uh, the the extension, and um, we. Um, what about the COVID testing for teachers? So. The, over the weekend, a survey was sent out to teachers and staff just to find out whether they're interested in getting a test. And I want to echo what Ms. Sexton said, very few communities are doing this. And this is expensive. And I want to thank the town of Arlington for willing to do this because this is a free service to all of our teachers. But anyway, we will get the results back this evening. That will allow the Board of Health to order the tests that they need to have. And then also we'll decide on um, right now we're planning on three sites, but we may not need three sites. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But the other important part about the testing is that it's going to be ongoing. So Arlington teachers can make an appointment at um, Armstrong Ambulance two days a week on Tuesday, Thursdays after school to arrange for, arrange for a test. So th that is in place. And uh, again, I think it's commendable that the town has, has devoted its resources to doing this. Um, the other uh, announcement for parents, and this is in, uh, we've, we've updated in, in, in documents out um, to the community, some of it's on our website, 
that vaccinations have been given a grace period of 60 days. So until just recently, if you were a parent sending your child to school in Arlington or any public school for that matter, you had to have your vaccinations um, up to date. But that has been extended for 60 days. But in Arlington, we have very, very high compliance. I think something like 98% of our families have um, vaccinations um, that are ready to enter school. So that's terrific. But I did want people to know to not panic if they haven't been able to get a doctor's appointment. Um, the uh, other thing that we are looking at, just it's not, it's still very much in the planning stages, but I did want the committee to know that we are looking into the possibility of with the um, to having some kind of babysitting in place for school aged children for our staff, but I can tell you more about that um, probably by the next meeting. And, you know, uh, one of the speakers earlier talked about social emotional, but I think one of the things you can see in the schedule and conversations been going on that this is a very high priority in terms of the work that we're gonna be doing with students, regardless of whether they're in the hybrid program or whether they're in the remote academy. So uh, I do wanna to, um, mention that. The other thing, and I'll just wrap up with this, is that we were talking about values. And this morning, we, we've just, we've just um, had gone through our new teacher orientation program last week which is a, a very intensive preparation time for our new teachers. We have about 40 and they were part of a meeting this morning. And the one thing that I, you know, I said to them besides, you know, becoming aware of our curriculum and all of our different, you know, procedures, protocols, and, and we can only do so much and that some of it will have to be learned as we go on. But that one of the things I wanted to make sure that they also appreciate it are what we value as a school district. And, and I talked to them about an excellent education for all of our students and that with the foundation and our vision of a student as a learner and a global citizen, which we have um, talked about many times at this table. We also prioritize very strongly social emotional well-being of our students and staff. And we cultivate and support a social, uh, school environments and practices that promote and sustain equity. And that is a very high priority. As I said, we're trying certainly to make sure that all of our environments are safe and healthy. And we have a strong commitment to the professional learning of all of our staff. And this includes um, ongoing implicit bias, anti-racism, uh, professional development, as well as culturally responsive teaching practices. So these, these are our values and our values are not changing even though we're going into different models this year. And I, I think it's important for the community to hear this and for all the people that um, are joining our school system this year. So that is uh, the report so far and I don't know if there's any questions that anyone would have. So uh, I want to get back to Mr. Hainer and I, Dr. Alice Nampi, do you have a question or a comment? A question. Okay. Dr. Alice Nampi. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bodhi, going back to the criteria, um, can we expect to see something more in writing in, um, at our next meeting? Um, I will see what we can have in writing. That's just about a week from now. Uh, but yes, the plan is that we are continuing to to talk with the Board of Health about that and make and put something in writing that we can share with all of you. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Uh, after hearing everything uh, at this time, I'm going to make a motion that the Arlington Public School System go remote with a phased in hybrid uh, for the entire district. Second. I may speak? Yes. Very briefly, uh, again, as I said before, this is not a reflection on any of the administrators. I have listened to the teachers, I've listened to the parents, and uh, I feel that at this time, this is not a reflection on your preparation and all the work that you folks have done. But I think it is important for us to do this a lot slower than we're doing it. Thank you. Other discussion? Mr. Cardin. 
Thank you. Um, so, I, again, I, I would defer to the administrative team. Um, certainly, if uh, there was a lot of concern about um, getting what needs to be done in the next three weeks done in three weeks, um, then I'd be happy to hear uh, a recommendation to um, to do things more slowly. But uh, I have not heard that. So uh, I do have to rely on our administrative team to make the determination. We, we have, you know, 21 days left. Um, can they get what's, what, what's done, done in 21 days? This is not never going to be perfect. This is always going to be uh, a very difficult model to implement. I don't really see how spending more time is going to, mar going to, going to more than marginally improve it. Um, there obviously are a lot of details to be worked out. There's a, a tremendous amount of work to be done over the next three weeks, but I'm not sure two additional weeks, four additional weeks, um, some districts are doing, you know, 10 additional weeks is going to really buy us much, uh, except perhaps a, a resurgence of, uh, of the virus, in which case um, we'll never get our kids and our kids will never see their teachers. So uh, I'm going to rely on our administrative team uh, and if, you know, by, by our next meeting on the 10th, if they determine that things need to go slower, then, then, then we'll, we'll hear that recommendation then. But uh, for now, um, I don't hear that. So I'm going to oppose this motion. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. Um, I, I want to remind the committee that the people of Arlington voted for us to make the decision. We shouldn't be sitting here waiting for a decision to be presented to us to be ratified. And all through this process, all summer, I felt that's the way we've been going, is that we haven't had the debate, we haven't had the discourse, we haven't weighed the options. Uh, in one of the subcommittee meetings, uh, it was just said matter of factly, well, if you wanted the best educational outcome and the safest model, you'd be going all remote. And I think that's exactly what we should be doing. This is a very, very difficult model to pull off, a very difficult one, because what you're doing is you're scheduling two different school districts in one set of schools. It is extraordinarily difficult. The way to pull this off the way to make this work is to start with everybody in place as a baseline in the hybrid model. Then as you open seats based on the highest needs and move on down the list to move people into remote. You start off in a team teaching model where you have two teachers working together. So kids, depending on how they split hybrid to remote, they maintain contact with their teaching team. So there's a continuity. If there is an emergency, it's easier to revert back to a rem all remote model if that's the way we started, rather than starting in a complex hybrid model and then trying to package everybody back into, in, into a remote learning plan. The logical starting point for a district in terms of moving kids into a hybrid program somewhere around fifth grade. I think that in a high school, it's much easier to start with and stay in, in, in a remote model. I have a hard time seeing how kindergarten kids are gonna benefit from COVID restricted teaching on an all day model. Yeah, we wanna get them into the buildings. We want them to acculturate. We want them to make connections but I don't see them walking around with social distancing and face masks and doing the kinds of things that happen in a good kindergarten under this model. People here have been working very, very hard, incredibly hard to try to pull off the impossible. And it's not easy to do, and it's taking a lot of time to do. There's still uncertainty hanging over it. And there are a lot of parents who are uneasy because of all this uncertainty. If we want to do what's best for kids, if we want to do what is the safest thing, then we start off with a full remote model and then gradually work kids into a, co into a uh, hybrid model. 
uh, expand it out as the situation permits. And then if there's a problem, we can very quickly bounce back into an all remote model, keep everybody safe and do the best thing for kids. And that's why I'm supporting Mr. Hainer's motion. Any more discussion? Dr. Alice Nampy? So if we wanna talk about what's best for kids, it depends on who you're talking to. If you talk to the American Association of Pediatrics, it's having the kids in school face to face with their teachers, even with masks on. If you talk to a whole lot of parents in Arlington, it's the same thing. Um, it's, I don't agree that the remote schooling is necessary by default better than the hybrid model. Um, I think that's taking a lot of assumptions about what's going on and how much kids get out of face-to-face -face time versus remote time and making those assumptions and, and going from there. Um, I agree with Mr. Cardin that I am listening to our administration because our role is to make policy decisions not to run the school district. I mean, we're trying to make sure that the decisions made are good ones and that they have the necessary information and have thought about the right things, but we're not supposed to be running the school, di school district. Um, I feel at this point in time that the hybrid model remains the model that we should go with. And that's also in the setting that we're in about as good a place as we could possibly be in terms of COVID um, with the number of cases that we have both in our town and in our county and in the surrounding communities. Um, and by going, to me it was a decision point where our three options are going full time, which I didn't think that our buildings or staffing would support, going back hybrid, so part time in person or part time remote, and then remote. By giving parents the option to have remote, I mean, to, to opt for a remote that allows the people who are really concerned or have, have family reasons or whatever that they feel being in the building is the problem. And then we're a, by having a hybrid option, we're able to offer those other parents the choice that they feel is best for their child. Um, okay, now I forgot where I was going with this. Um, we, Um, okay, I totally lost my train of thought. This is a problem with Zoom meetings. Um, I think that we're offering, we need, there are definitely concerns about what's going on in terms of the remote schedules and stuff. There's kinks and things that need to be worked out, but that doesn't mean that they can't be worked out. And by putting everyone in a remote schedule, we, even if we choose to do a phase in later because we realize there's some things that we have to work out first, we're able to do that. If we just go totally remote, which it sort of to me sounded like what Mr. Hainer was proposing, we won't be able to bring kids back at all. So, um, Anyway, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote against this motion, um, and I'll see what the administration brings to us next week. Also, Ms. Keys. Hi. Um, I just want to make everybody make sure everybody understands. Our teachers want to be in the building. Like that is the primary goal. To the point where it, we are involuntarily transferring teachers to remote positions. That's happening this week. We want to be in the buildings with the kids. 
this is not going to work. I mean, just from great, we have a sample model from one teacher. Can you scale it up to the whole school? Like, do we have the staff to cover it? And at some point, we actually have to plan. We don't just walk in on the first day of school and everything magically happens. It takes a lot of planning. And every teacher in the district right now is looking at September 18th, the Friday before the kids start, and we're going, what if we don't have staff in place by that day? Are we going to get told, oops, sorry, can't open the building, readjust everything over the weekend to start remotely? We have to plan. And it's like, I, I said this to you at the beginning of August, like, if you're not sure we can do this, give us a chance to start successfully. And then, you know, if the staffing's in place, we can set a date and move in to a hybrid. But I don't know what you expect the staff to be doing in these next nine days when everyone's just sitting around going, do we have enough tasks? Do we have enough TAs yet? Do we have enough TAs yet? Is yet? Like, there's got to come a point where you say, this is the goal. We all want to get there. We need more time. And we need more time. It's not that we don't want to go into the building. It's not that we don't think that's the best thing for the kids. It's that if it's not structurally feasible, and I'm not talking about minor little scheduling issues, and you keep talking about having all this time, we start Wednesday. 21st might be where kids come, but like we have teachers starting the school year not knowing what they're teaching. Like at some point, you just have to say, we need more time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more com any more comments? Ms. Exton. Um, so this is this is um, this is a challenge for me. Um, I I've heard um, you know a lot of the concerns about the scheduling, the staffing. Um, at the same time, um, as an early childhood teacher, as much as kindergarten is not going to look like it has looked, um, I have real concerns about what kindergarten will look like on a Zoom screen as well. Um, and then thinking about a phased in model without, you know, specific dates makes it really hard for me to support this motion. Um, I guess, you know, what I'm thinking about is if, if the administration felt like a phased in um, remote, um, starting remote and phasing in at certain levels um, was something that was recommended, I would consider supporting that. But um, I, I, th I really think that particularly the elementary students need to be starting um, in the classroom in a hybrid model from, from the beginning. Um, so as the motion is now, I'm, I'm not going to support it either. All right, anybody else? Okay, uh, so a uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman, Ms. Exton? No. Mr. Cardin? No. Dr. Allison Ampey? No. Mr. Thielman? No. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I'm also a no. Okay, um, let's see. So is that the end of your report, Dr. Bodhi? Have we covered that? Are we ready to move on? Yes, we're ready to move on. Okay. Um, the consent agenda, all, agen all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 21039. Check date will be Tuesday, August 25th, 2020, in the amount of $611,602.73. So moved. Second. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also a yes. Uh, 
policy second read files uh, EBC, BEDB, JJK, and the added EBCFA. Mr. Schlickman? I move adoption on second read with the amendment to EBC supplemental. Second. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Um, subcommittee and liaison reports and announcement, community relations, Mr. Hayner. Nothing on the committee to report, but I have a question. Uh, will community relations be the one that's doing the selection for members for the uh, superintendent search committee? I don't know if that should be discussed now or at the, another meeting. Can you take that? Could you uh, bring that to the superintendent search process committee meeting? I'd be happy to. Thank you. With Mr. Schlickman? Great. Uh, the uh, superintendent uh, search uh, committee, I would think, is charged with that task. Okay. Arlington High School Building Committee, uh, Mr. Thielman. Ms. Morgan? So uh, yeah. Can I interrupt for a sec? Yeah, sorry, I see your little blue hand. Yeah, um, did, Mr. Schlickman, did we pass the face mask um, policy? Yes, we did. Okay, sorry, thank you. Mr. Thielman? Uh, you know, we're moving along at a good pace and uh, we had some good news last week with some uh, savings in our budget. Were we able to uh, do some good things for the schools? I don't know, Dr. Bodie wants to add anything. Dr. Bodie, do you want to add anything at all about the building committee? No, I, I think that you're absolutely right that we had some very good news on our 90% cost, uh, cost proposals. And so we were able to add some things back that we thought uh, really uh, were a positive for the school, both aesthetically and in terms of su sustainability was an important feature on that. Um, some of that had to do with triple glazing. It's not exactly um, uh, something that is aesthetic, but it certainly is going to make a big difference. We also were able to, to change the, the flooring on the, on the entrance areas on those floors to a terraza. So that was very positive. Uh, but there, there were a, a number of brick things. But the, the committee uh, agreed on it, and we were able to take a, a, quite a few things off of the alternate list. But at the same time, keeping some uh, some cushion for later on should we need it. So it was it was very good news where we are, and we're moving along. I, I do know, and I, uh, for those that have been listening to the pile drivings that have been going on in the front of the high school, that is going to improve fairly soon. So. That's, that's good news for those that are sitting in a building that's shaking, and, but that will end. Yeah, and, and parents had questions about soil testing and uh, air quality and that sort of thing, and we are, we are updating uh, our website with information to answer specific questions. So, but it's moving along well, and uh, we're very excited about it. A lot of good news there. Mm -hmm. uh, liaison reports. Announcements. Future agenda items. Um, okay, so the last item on our agenda is executive session to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. We have a motion to go into executive session. So move. Second. Um, and we are not, we are going to adjourn from executive session and will not be coming back. So uh, roll call vote, uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I'm also a yes.